Well, didn't see that for those of you watching on YouTube. Great Cup was great. Covering it was awesome. But you know what? For as much as I love the CFL, we're back to the NFL. And you know what? Miami versus New York is the big game on Friday at MetLife. But on Sunday, the Patriots, the Giants. This was supposed, I'll be honest with y'all and the viewers at home. It's Jared. It's Big Rat. Danny was supposed to be here, but he couldn't make it. Or I don't know if he was too ashamed to talk about the, you know, a little boil. But, um, gentlemen, how are we feeling on this Thanksgiving? We record a little earlier than usual, but it's what, what I do for American Thanksgiving because I know you guys are busy pretty much for the next few days onward. Doing great. I'm happy to sub out one disappointing New York team for another. It's very cool. It's seamless transition, you know. And I, it is kind of an interesting part of the football calendar where similarly, like for all the gambling I'm doing this weekend, it's like all the week – 12 gambling pods they're all coming out today like all the content is coming out immediately before injury reports come out because everyone's trying to get all the information out before the thanksgiving game starts so it's a it's a fun week i'm excited yeah definitely i mean because also too i i want you to well you go first jared oh no i was just gonna say i mean like the fact that we got like the first ever black friday game i mean we you know we're seeing this now with like um, just the way that the holiday calendars are falling, like with Christmas and New Year's the last couple of years. So it was only a matter of time before, you know, with Black Friday, most people are off. Most people, uh, you know, not at work and everything. So you might as well take advantage of it. It's an afternoon game. Uh, kind of, I mean, kind of a weird one for a, a game at 3 p.m. on a Friday. But, yeah, I mean, based on, you know, to bigger ass point with, uh, you know, the gambling aspect, and everybody like you know trying to get their picks out early. The books opening up the lines early for the Thursday games. It's like you know it doesn't even feel like a you know one week to the next. It just feels like one continuous thing from last week into this one. Like this is just you know a part two. So it should be a lot of fun. Hands up for those of you at Eagles plus two and a half last night. Oh, oh my little one. That was, that was bullshit. The Chiefs Eagles should have covered that game. The Chiefs should have covered that game. They clearly outplayed Philly. Those, like, Philly, it's one thing when you win a close game when, like, the edge rusher makes a key sack in a key moment or the defensive back breaks up the ball in the end zone. They do nothing to cause that drop by MBS in the end zone. They Philly contributes nothing to KC no. not hitting on that play. Like, absolutely should have lost that game. So frustrating. But congrats. I may have had Chiefs minus two and a half, maybe. <laughs> I got screwed by A.J. Brown having the worst game of his life, of course. So who could have seen that coming except it's a primetime game. So natural And the, the super boosts always give it away. There's Especially when, it, when I mean, you got A.J. It was A.J. for 50, Kelsey for 40, Hurts for 25. There had to be at least one bad leg in there. It, it's a perfect blueprint for what not to do. If you ever look at those FanDuel super boosts. As they say. A thousand percent. The books are not your friends. Never forget no. that. The books are not your friends. It's us against them at the end of the day. And with that, first game of the Thanksgiving weekend, it's coming along right here now. Detroit versus Green Bay. Detroit at minus seven and a half. Um, I like Detroit to win, but that number I just learned from over the years, Big Rat. What do you do in divisional games when it's a spread of seven or more? You take the underdog. Mm. Typically, yeah. This is – I'm curious. I wonder if Detroit – you know, this is kind of the first year that they get to host Thanksgiving while, like, being seen as one of the best teams in the NFL. It's been the first time in, you know, decades since they've had this moment. So I do wonder – I don't know. Is there, like, a special energy to that crowd? Is there a little bit of excitement that, like, oh, wow, the week – the yearly Thanksgiving game we're hosting is actually meaningful. It's meaningful in the standings. Like, they're the face of national television for a little bit. I do wonder if you get a – bit more of an inspired effort than you normally would, even though it would always be an inspired effort already. I wonder if there's like an extra notch for that reason. Uh, I, I, I was going to say, I see it the op. sorry to cut you off, but I see it the opposite way where it's that, you know, it's that high pedestal. You're eight, you're eight and two, you're, wait, have they had their bye week yet? I'm trying to think about this. They've had their bye week. There's the, yeah, there's seven, there's seven and two and they're eight and two. The bye weeks are confusing, but like they've only lost two games in the year. It's that like, you know, typical, let down spot because I also think it's been a long time since they've actually won a home game on Thanksgiving at Fort Field. And I think I think this line is a very good line. Uh, I I I think it's fine to take the Packers, but it's to me this seems like the exact kind of game where the Packers will be trailing by eight or by seven on the last play of the game with going Jordan Love driving down the field going for the win 
leading to a turnover. I know last week they were doing that and they actually scored a touchdown this time and won the game. But for most of the season, what happens in that spot is they turn it over. So I do kind of wonder, it seems very good, a very good line for that reason. It kind of seems like they'll be down by seven or eight with the ball last, chance to win, turn it over, Lions win. So I, I, I have no idea. I feel like it's going to probably hang around that range for most of the game, but I think Detroit wins by double digits in the end. To me, this – I ordinarily I would buy into the whole letdown narrative against a division rival, but to me, with the Lions, the way that their schedule fell, they kind of had that game against Chicago already. Although they won the game, it was 100% a trap divisional game for them. They were losing by multiple scores. They were looking pretty bad, you know, in the fourth quarter. Like, you know, I mean, they easily could have let that game slip away. That could have been their wake-up call. And I think it still was their wake-up call. Even though they won, it was kind of like an oh-shit moment. And now I think that going up against Green Bay, you got a team that is ranking bottom five in the league against the run. And finally, Detroit has both of their running backs healthy and cooking at this point. So I think that this is a game where Green Bay hangs around – in the first half, but by the second, you get Montgomery and Gibbs going. They're going to burn some serious clock. I feel like they're going to hold a steady 7-10 to 10 point lead most of the game and then get that final touchdown to put it away in the fourth quarter. Remember, too, Montgomery had an unreal game back in uh, week three as well against the Sa- – oh, week four against St. Packers on Thursday Night Football. I think he had like 25 fantasy points or something like that. I drafted David Montgomery in my home league. I was very high on him, and I got criticized by it a lot by my friends when I was telling them, you guys are making the classic mistake. You think Gibbs, because he was the first-round pick, is going to get every carry. This is dumb. It's going to be 50-50, and Montgomery's probably going to get most of the goal line work. Like, this is not the right way to do it. And me, the smart genius, because Montgomery was hurt the prior week, and that was a Thursday night game, forgot to start him um, before Mm -hmm. that. Before that Thursday night game kicked off. And uh, yeah. I was watching with a buddy that night who was in the exact same situation. He was kicking himself in the pants forever. Um, the Lions, by the way, the last time they won at home on Thanksgiving, 2016. So it's been seven, it'll be seven years since their last home game on Thanksgiving. So we'll wait and see what happens. Like, I think the Lions will win the game. I could just see a world where that back door is left a little bit open for the Green Bay Packers. It wouldn't surprise me at all if they won by double digits, like Jared said. I personally think they'll lose by yeah. eight, but I can see them losing by 10 or 14 or whatever. But I will say as a general theme, even if we don't see it on this day, what you want to see with the Packers, last week, like Jared and I offline have kind of been talking a lot about the Packers this year. And last week was like exactly what I was kind of hoping for, where, yes, they're young. They're playing a young quarterback. They're playing three super young receivers. And, yes, they make a lot of stupid mistakes. They fumble a lot. They're not aligned properly. They're penalized all the time. They Jordan Love throws a key interception late in the game. They were doing that all year. Last week you kind of started to see the young guys getting better as the season goes along. We started to see them throw less to Christian Watson, even though he scored in that game, and more to uh, Jaden Reed, Dontavious Wicks, and uh, Romeo Dobbs. And I feel like yep. – I feel like the combination of all four of them, even if none of them is an individual wide receiver one, I feel like they're all getting a little better every week. And I feel like last week you kind of saw them finally improve from what they were earlier in the season and put it all together at a key moment in the game when everyone was criticizing them for not being able to do exactly that. If I would have told you before the season they'll lose to Denver and the Raiders but beat the Chargers, you would have thought that was insane. But that's exactly what happened. Young team, dumber earlier in the season, a little bit better as the year goes along. Um, I have a great team to compare them to from last year. That's like the Pittsburgh Steelers from last year where they had a bit of a yeah. s- bad start. And then towards the end, they found their footing to where now they'll be in a, that position at like, hey, week 18, you got to win to make it into the playoffs. And you, then they, they fall like fall. Actually, no, they'll play Chicago in the last week. But I feel like it's because of X, Y, and Z and what you did earlier on comes back to bite you and you miss the playoffs. We actually, it's funny. We've actually, me and Ricky have been going back and forth. Um, basically saying that the Steelers and the Packers, I, I made the comment that they're basically the same team, but the, yeah. you know, the bounces are falling the Steelers way, not really falling the Packers way. Very similar. Yeah. yeah. I would probably, I mean, I don't know. I would probably say that Pickett makes less mistakes than Love does. Um, that being said, I mean, the Packers probably have the deeper committee. However, the individual the individual talent of a Deontay Johnson or a George Pickens, I think, outweighs that of what we've seen so far from to, – like, to me, Christian Watson probably was the most overhyped receiver going into the year. This is a guy who, 
Aaron Rodgers, honestly, the production was very inconsistent last year. There were a few big bombs that hit and a lot that missed, a lot of miscommunications, and now you significantly downgrade the skill at the quarterback position, and he's pretty much done nothing all year long. So I think that's a big reason why the Packers are in the spot that they're in. Also, it's Aaron Jones um, not being healthy and them not really able to establish much consistency in the run game. So that's why they are not the worst team in the league, not like a bottom of the barrel, but uh, trending in that direction. Yeah, I, I completely agree. But like like, I, like I'm saying, the whole comparison thing, it's just that whole, like, you know, that like team that will end up finishing 7-10 and 10 or 8-9, and, and then it's kind of like, hey, next year, Next year, kind of watch out for them where everyone will kind of, kind of invest in them way too early. And then, like, they got off to a bad start next year. Everyone's kind of like, um, you guys good? Um, but the second game of Thanksgiving. Wait, wait. Before, go before we go on, I just want to say very quickly. I do agree. But one thing to watch out for, if the Packers, we'll see, like, how many games they win. You know, they do play your Giants, Jared. They play the Bears at home. They play the yeah. Vikings again, which I think could, act, as good as the Vikings are playing right now, I do kind of wonder, kind of like how Dobbs got a little bit worse every week with the Cardinals. I do wonder if you start to see that with Minnesota. And even though the rematch is in Minnesota, I don't think those teams are so far apart that that game is unwinnable. And they also – At that point, uh, just, yeah, Justin Jefferson will be back by that point, though. That's going to give him a little bit of a boost. They're better without Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside. Anyways, and they play the Bucks too. That's a very winnable game. But anyways, we'll see, we'll see how many games they end up winning. One thing to watch out for, if the Saints don't win that division, and I – personally would bet against them winning the division personally, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about them when we talk about the Atlanta game, but if the saints don't win that division and it's them and green Bay fighting for a wild card spot, green Bay having that tiebreaker earlier in the year, I think might matter. Cause I think they're both probably finished with like a very similar record, whether it's nine. Or- yeah. I completely, completely agree with you on there. Um, I just want to move on to the next game because I have a bold statement to make and I don't know. I don't think they're going to win, but I, I like watching them cover the plus 11. I know everyone's like, for a few reasons. One, Dallas has won a couple of big games. Obviously, they whooped the, the, the Giants last week, and then they beat up on the Panthers two days ago. But for this game, there's the rumblings about could Rivera be fired on Friday because if they lose in this big spot. And also, too, they covered those two big spreads against Philadelphia earlier this year. At, I believe it was like plus eight, plus eight and a half and seven and a half. And when I see plus 11, I feel like more than Detroit having a letdown spot on Thanksgiving, I wouldn't shock me to see more of Dallas having that letdown spot on Thanksgiving. They've done it before. Like, remember there was a game a few years ago against Buffalo, and then even two years ago where Vegas went in there and beat them. Dallas is 1-5 and five against the spread on Thanksgiving with Dak Prescott as quarterback. So The Giants covered last year. I was on that. I got criticized for that. Giants, I think it was like plus 10.5, and, and they backdoored it. And the commanders, the commanders have been the team I've made the most money on gambling wise because I think they're very easy to predict. You take it's very much like Baker Mayfield when he was with Cleveland and Jameis Winston when he was with the Bucks. A quarterback like Sam Howell, you take him as an underdog, you fade him as a favorite. Very clear. Look at the last few weeks. They were laying eight points against the Giants. I was on the Giants. A lot of people were. And the Giants ended up winning Giants. Out, Giants ended up winning outright. They were laying seven points against the Bears. Back when the Bears Hadn't won a game yet, and the Bears won outright, won easily. The jo- the Commanders were underdogs against the Eagles both times, played them close both times. Underdog against your Patriots, beat them outright. Underdog against Seattle, covered with a late touchdown at the end of the game. He's a high-variance quarterback who leads the NFL in passing, not just passing yards, passing attempts. So with the amount of sacks that he takes, you see a lot of volatility. You see a lot of touchdowns. You see a lot of interceptions. You see a lot of sacks. It's perfect for – don't take him as a favorite because he's liable to take a bad sack or have a bad turnover. But when he's a big underdog, he's likely to lead a touchdown drive late in the fourth quarter to cover or win the game outright, covering in the case of the Seahawks game being a great example. So he's been very predictable this year, betting-wise. Fade him as a favorite, take him against the spread. I think this is another example. Even if the Cowboys are up by 14 in the last minute of the game, you have the chance of Howell leading the drive to get you in the window. Even if the Cowboys are up by 17, Sam Howell can still lead a game-winning fourth-quarter drive to get the cover. I like the commanders on the spread here. It's kind of their season. They're four and six. They desperately need to win this game. I do not think they'll win this game, but I do think you'll get an inspired effort because the difference between four and six and four and seven is pretty significant. So I like the commanders. One, one, point, one point I want to make before Jared goes, uh, Washington also is five and one against the spread on the road this year. Another good example. Yep. Yeah, this is kind of a borderline one for me because, I mean, there's 
you know, all the factors that you guys mentioned uh, for, you know, Washington, uh, you know, keeping it a tight game and just the fact that they, they typically do show up against the Cowboys on, you know, they've played them on Thanksgiving multiple times over the last several years. It's just, oh, the timing of this. I mean, coming off of like turning the ball over that many times against the Giants, and now you're coming to play an even better defense. You know, yeah, logic says this should be a Dallas blowout. Will it? Yeah, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of leaning in the direction of you guys. Of uh, you know, I mean, the you know Washington, they just they throw it so often, and I mean Howell's not afraid to use those receivers. I mean, I know Dotson's been kind of a here and there this year, um, but you know they got to get McLaurin going after. I mean, I'm sure he's pissed after Deontay Banks completely shut him down. So I could see this being a low key shootout, but I like yeah, like Dallas to win, but Wash to cover, I could totally see. It's just it's just because it's the plus eleven. If this was like nine and a half, I would probably lean Dallas. Yeah, I, I, I could see this being a ten double, pointer. I guess. Double digits, double digits, especially in a divisional game, a is just too million. hard to predict. I, I can um, I can only, even see like a weird a weird situation where they lose by exactly eleven because the score is manipulated in a way where Washington like gets a two point conversion and it's like you're down by a field goal and eight points as well. On top of that, we've seen. Since teams have been going for two more often, we've seen that 8 and 11 starts to matter a little more in the spread. It's a little more frequent for games to fall on those two numbers. So, yeah, it wouldn't, yeah. It wouldn't even surprise me if you see something like they're down by, like, 19 or 18 and do a two-point conversion or something to attempt to get within the cover window. So, yeah. Like, I can easily see this game being, like, 31 to 20, for example, and it just, like, the spread hits right then and there. Yeah, 31 to 20, Washington covers. Simple as that. Yeah. Simple as that. Uh, Thursday night, San Francisco, Seattle. Um, part of me wants to say this game will be a shootout, but every time I feel like a Seattle game is going to be a shootout, it always is boring, especially with Drew Locke, quarterback. A quarterback, uh, Big Rat, you know, I've been very critical of ever since his uh, days. Well, you know, I was always critical of Fick Fangio from the jump of this podcast. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I want it to be a shootout, but I don't think it will. I think it's going to be a lower scoring game. Uh, when these, like, I, I just think that, it being in Seattle, Seattle's going to give a good effort. They actually played on Thursday Night Football last year. Not on Thanksgiving, but like a few weeks after Thanksgiving. And the score was like 21 to 13, something like that. And I kind of kind of see a similar game. You can kind of see Seattle. Big game for the Seahawks, obviously. Them losing both games to the Rams, not even getting one of them, I think is could very well end up costing them the playoffs because their schedule is so hard. They After this game – they play the Cowboys, the Eagles, and the Niners again. So that is a brutal, brutal four-game stretch. And this is the one that's at home. This is the one that they're going to really give an inspired effort to try to win. But Gino with the injury, I do think Gino's going to play. Uh, I think so. I don't know if that's confirmed, but it seemed like Gino was going to give it a chance to try to play hurt. I think the Niners are going to maybe win more of a sloppy game where both defenses play really well. Game's a little tight, kind of low-scoring. And for that reason, personally, for any of you out there that play Thanksgiving DFS, this is the game I'm trying to stay away from. And I know this is the game that has all the big names with McCaffrey and Debo and Kittle and Lockett and Metcalf. And like a lot of people are going to play Zach Charbonnet because Kenneth Walker's not going to play in this game. Uh, but I would be very hesitant because this tight division night game with the Seahawks, like really, really going to giving an inspired effort here. I'm kind of expecting like a 20 to 13 kind of game. So I, I, I personally, I think that this is like a 20 to six kind of game. Honestly, I, I think that you, you take Walker out of the equation, you take Gino out of the equation. I think the Niners defense just handles them the entire time. Um, I can see this being a game where Drew Lock gets like nothing going. And I mean, this could be something where if you're, if you're on any Seattle guys, it'll just make your head spin. Cause um, I, I think that they're just too limited without those guys on offense. And, and Gino's been kind of inconsistent this year anyway. There's been a lot of games this year where you, you take the Bengals. The Bengals game is a perfect example. You would think on paper, oh, this is going to be a shootout. You got these great receivers on both teams. Both teams didn't even score 20 points. Seattle's kind 17 of just, to 14. Yeah, yeah, 17 to 13, right? So I think with, with Lockett quarterback, um, San Francisco, and now with some momentum, you know, a little losing skid that they've kind of snapped out of that funk. I think that this is a game where the defense takes over. McCaffrey runs it down their throat. And I think it, it just winds up being one of those, you know, just 
boring Thanksgiving Eve games. We've, we've gotten a lot of those over the years where the, the Thanksgiving night game is just kind of a, a ho-hum, run the clock out. And I think it's going to feel like from beginning to end that San Francisco is just kind of taking care of business. It's a shame because like, I, I care so much about the Thanksgiving night game, and I feel like lately, more often than not, it's been a little bit of a disappointment. I guess your Patriots and the Vikings kind of gave us a sneaky, fun shootout last year, but it was should have fucking won that game. It, yeah, and it, it was just hard to get like super invested in it as a fan because like I didn't want the Patriots to win; they should have won. It was kind of like weird from that perspective. Like I feel like the NFL, we have such a good opportunity to have high level. Thanksgiving night games. This should be the biggest game of the calendar. Your best primetime game. You should put in this spot. And for whatever reason, we just lately over the last like five, six years, we never, we never really seem to have it. Like I feel like with the NFL on Thanksgiving too, they always like to go for either like how this year is all divisional games for some reason, or they'll do like the random year where it's like all these fun games. Like how last year we had Detroit, Buffalo, we had New England, Minnesota. Um, even going back to like da- like Dallas and Las Vegas, like I would have loved to have seen this year. Like, like I don't know why not put Detroit versus Seattle as Thanksgiving game or Detroit versus Vegas, for example, instead of having that like cliche division games. I feel like nine times out of ten, the first two are always divisional games. So you know what? Throw a random game in there. I know they they just played last night, but Philadelphia Buffalo in this spot would have been incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking through it historically, and it's like we had we had Pittsburgh Baltimore in 2020 that got canceled because of COVID, and it got moved to the Wednesday. following week. Yeah, it got moved to a Wednesday of the following week. Like that could have been fun, but generally, literally, I'm just looking at the last few years. Buffalo it's generally been really disappointing. We had like two years of Falcon Saints games where the Saints like blew them out mm-hmm. both times. Yeah, it's just eh, we could do better. No, I remember yeah, a few years back the Giants played the. Uh, the, the then okay. Redskins on Thanksgiving, and that was during that was uh, during our 2017 uh, miserable um, Eli Manning uh, almost swan song, and yeah, that was one of like the most depressing Thanksgiving night games you could ever imagine. Really, our whole season was like that. But I just remember that was like the worst way for me to end the holiday. Yeah, I could count like since since like 2010. Here are the memorable Thanksgiving night games. It's like when the Ravens played the Steelers in 2013, when yeah. Mike Tomlin like almost ran into Jacoby Jones in the kick return. Like that was kind of fun. That was like a right. three point. Hey, the one the year before was a lot of fun too. With the, 2012, with the Patriots destroying the Jets like 49 to 10 or whatever. That oh, was 49 to 19. Butt fumble. Yeah, yes. the butt yeah. fumble. And people forget immediately after the butt fumble, the Jets fumbled the kickoff and the Patriots scored on the kickoff. The very next play after yep. the butt fumble. <laughs> That, that was fun in a perverse way. And then the only – the other one that I kind of liked, aside from last year, I guess, was 2015 Packers-Bears, which was the Brett Favre retirement – Jersey retirement game. And that was like – it was a big deal at the time because he had like a bad relationship with Green Bay on the way out. And they mm-hmm. spent like seven years before they can reconcile and retire his jersey. They finally did it halftime of the Thanksgiving game, and they lost outright to the Jay Cutler Bears. That was kind of fun. In its own weird way. But yeah, that's it's like that, the Steelers game, and last year, maybe that's over 10 years, like three good games out of 10 years. We gotta do better than this. Yeah, because they're always they're always gonna be ratings monsters. That's the other thing too about it. So I feel like the NFL is kind of like in that we don't care who we put in here, so because we know people are gonna watch, even though by this point of the night, your uncle has gone from criticizing each team and player to sleeping on the couch with pie in his uh, barrel. Mm-hmm. At least, at least we're not getting Lions Bears again because they, they would always do that for your exact logic. It's like the noon Thanksgiving game is the second most watched game of the year behind the Cowboys Thanksgiving yep. game. So they just put Lions Bears in there because you could put literally the worst game possible and everyone will still watch it. So let's like save the good games for other primetime games. But come on, NFL, we need to change a philosophy here. We should make this your WrestleMania. This in many ways could be the WrestleMania. That's not the playoffs. Let's do better. One game I almost thought they could have done at the beginning of the year was Dallas versus either New England or New York, but I'm really glad they didn't go that route considering how both team seasons have gone. But with that, yeah. Friday, Black Friday, I almost said big for some reason. Black Friday, first ever Black Friday football game. Before we get to the Dolphin fan in the room, Jared. What? what, what our what resident Jets fan. Yeah. Our our resident, resident, oh, wait. 
Yeah, the resident jet fan is uh, couldn't make it. He was too big for us, or just wanted to avoid this conversation as a whole. Uh, but Jared, <laughs> serious question for you: Does yeah. the Tim Boyle led Jets cover the ten point spread? No, no, they don't. I mean, l- listen, I, I the Jets offense has given nobody any reason to believe that they can sustain drives. Like they're now in the Giants camp, right? Where they can't run plays. So you got no offensive line. You got a quarterback that doesn't know what he's doing. It's a short week. I I don't see any. I mean, and Miami really like this offense is you're gonna okay, big guy. You're you're gonna like me here. This offense is too good to go this long without a blowout. They are overdue to absolutely kick somebody's ass. And I yeah, the Jets, yes, Jets have a formidable defense, but I think that this is just a game where they're on the field so much that they just get worn out. I think that this is a run it down their throats with Mostert. Eventually something opens up, you know, in the passing game after enough of that has taken place. Maybe Miami doesn't – I'm not saying Miami's going to score a zillion points here. Not saying it's going to be a 40 to zip. But I think a solid 24 to 3 – a solid 27 to 6 type of affair is in order here. I just don't think the Jets are going to get anything going. Uh, there was a game on Monday Night Football two years ago. The Dolphins played the Saints. Oh, I it remember that one. Yes, it was. Uh, you kind of know where I'm going with this. James Winston had tore his ACL, and then Taysom Hill got Ian COVID. Book at quarterback. <laughs> it was Ian Book at quarterback. And. The Dolphins got a pick six in the very first play of the game, or like the first drive of the game, even if it wasn't the first play. And uh, they ended up winning 20 to three. And the Dolphins' offense was struggling. Granted, that offense obviously not like this offense, but the offense struggled for like a half. It was like 10 3 for most of the game. And then in the third quarter, in the middle of the third quarter, you kind of got that like drive, touchdown. 17-3 17-3 with six minutes left in the third over, game over. Like, like once it's 17-3, the other quarterback has no shot. And you can all, we're all just kind of killing time. If anyone ever wants to go back, not that any of you would ever do this, but, like, watch the game log of the fourth quarter of that game, and it is absolutely hilarious. The Dolphins legit did not throw the ball. Like, but there was, like, a common understanding from both teams. Even though it's only a two-touchdown game, this is over. Like, let's just run out the clock, like, you know, like, make sure no one gets hurt. They kind of treated it like the preseason. Like, let's just get this shit over with and move on. Uh, I am concerned for – I'm not concerned. I'm curious how the passing game will look like because the Jets, obviously, historically this year, have humiliated most quarterbacks they played. They humiliated Patrick Mahomes. I mean, the Chiefs at least still won. But you get, you get what I'm trying to say. He threw two yeah. picks. He had a pass. They humiliated Josh Allen, for sure, They the first time. They super humiliated Jalen Hurts. Super. God, that was easily, like, the worst game Hurts has had in the NFL, like, much less right. this year. And so they ha- – and they kind of, they kind of like, beat up on Justin Herbert, too. Their offense was just so incompetent that they couldn't do anything about it. But that was one of Herbert's weaker games this year as well. So I do kind of worry, is Tua, like, next on their mm-hmm. list? Um, not that I think that would result in a loss, but it's kind of the situation of, can we get the blowout out of the way early? Can we not like wait till the fourth quarter till we have the dagger touchdown to go up by two touchdowns? Can we like, can we do it early in the game and I can kind of spend the whole game chilling? I don't want to have to wait till the very end of the game. Uh, I think Tim Boyle is going to really struggle against this defense. I think Tim Boyle is going to be worse than Zach Wilson. His touchdown to interception ratio in the NFL is worse than Zach Wilson's. I think it's ridiculous that Tim Boyle is even starting. I think they should have gone to Trevor Simeon. I think the argument that Tim Boyle knows the system is not a good enough excuse. Not that Simeon is great, but he's at least won games in the NFL. He took over for Jameis Winston when he tore his ACL against the Bucs in 2021 and won the game with the Saints. Like, at the very least, I think he can give you one good game, even if every game after that he would start to suck. So I think Tim Boyle is not NFL caliber. And I just – the Dolphins' defense gets better and better every week. The Dolphins' defense is now as good as its offense, if not better. The Dolphins' defense is playing really, really well with Jalen Ramsey coming back. Jalen Ramsey has three interceptions in two in three games. He leads the team in interceptions. He has played three games. He has been that impactful right away. And kind of over the last three years, the Dolphins have really struggled to fill the opposite boundary corner spot opposite Xavier Howard. They had Byron Jones – in 2021 but then he got hurt 
He didn't stay healthy. He was in and out of the lineup that year. But then 2022, he missed the entire season. And the Dolphins constantly had like a rotating door of Keon Crossin and Nick Needham, who's normally a slot corner, and they put him on the outside. Uh, like Justin Bethel, Noah Igbenogany. It was awful. And the Dolphins' defense last year was incompetent on the road. I never, never believe they could really win the Super Bowl last year because I did not trust their defense on the road in the playoffs to be able to get stops. This year, it was kind of similar. They put Tater Kohu on the boundary, but he, again, like Needham, is better suited in the slot. He's not really meant to play that role. Kind of got abused by Stephon Diggs when they played the Bills earlier in the year. So Jalen Ramsey, it's not just that he is great. It's that he is also what they were missing. He is the missing piece. He is the key to the final door in the video game. Like he was the picture perfect. If you could wish on this defense the first seven weeks, what is the one guy we need? We need Jalen Ramsey specifically. Good thing he was already on the team. So defense, I think, is going to prevent Tim Boyle. If, they, if the Jets score, it's going to be entirely because Tua pick sixes, Dolphins fumble sixes, a special teams touchdown, or the Dolphins like turn it over in their own territory and the Jets are like on the five-yard line and Brees Hall gets in. You know, I can't see – I can't see a Tim Boyle, like, orchestrated offensive drive scoring a touchdown. I can see a bunch of field goals. I cannot see them scoring seven points on their own with, like, the ball at their 20-yard line. I would really struggle to see that. So it's just a question of how well is the passing game going to play. Uh, Tua has not played the Jets in two years. He missed both games last year. It was very strange. For two separate injuries, and he missed both games. So we haven't – he even said as much in his presser, like, he doesn't really know how this is going to go because he hasn't. Even though they're a division opponent, there's so much familiarity. He hasn't played them in so long that it's it's kind of unclear what it's going to look like. So I'm I'm curious to find out. The other part of the NFL schedule that's weird too, because you say that is that's this is the first time both teams have played each other this year, and yet Miami and New England have already played twice. Dallas and Washington, this is the first time they play each other. And hell, another example I'm going to give: the Giants do not play the Eagles until Christmas Day. Yeah, like they play them twice in three weeks. So a uh, little stocking stuffer for everyone is a Boston Scott touchdown. Jared, I'm sorry. It's just it's what's going to happen. Um, but we'll talk about that in a month. For s- Friday, though, I'm going to give a bet that I love. That's a Raheem Mostert anytime touchdown. I don't know what the odds are on error right now, but I feel like it's just it's going to happen, especially because we don't know what Tyreek's hand situation is going to be. I thought Tyreek Hill was going to cook the Raiders, to be honest with you, but got he hurt. Did. So we'll, wait, he did. Oh, I didn't he see did the numbers. He had 146 in a touchdown. He cooked the Raiders. He he did leave the game midway through. That is true. Um, but he the thing is, he did so much of his damage early. He had like mm. 75 yards in the first quarter because he's a freak and he can do that. And then this is the max yards by four. Do you guys see my what my cup is right now, what it says on it? Gray cup. I was so consumed with the Grey Cup on Sunday that I barely paid attention to any. This is like the first time in like years that I spent an, an NFL Sunday, like literally watching no NFL. I was so I was so consumed with other football. I watched Red Zone for like five minutes in the broadcast center on Sunday afternoon because I was mm-hmm. so. Which, if you guys want, it was, it was a great game, twenty eight twenty four final finish. But um, yeah, that's what I just wanted to say. Before, and before we go to the next game, I'll just say like, take this under. The total is like forty one. What the fuck are we doing? Like the Dolphins might win this game seventeen to three. The Dolphins, even if the Dolphins win twenty eight to three, that still goes under. The That's Dolphins, true. it could be thirty one to it could be thirty one to six. Thirty one to six. It could be miraculously twenty to seventeen. Resilient Jets cover and or win because if the Jets win, it's not going to be with offense. It's going to be because our offense like really struggled to score twenty points. Mm, yeah, like yeah. what are, what are we doing with a total of forty one? How on earth is this game going to go over that? Well, it's a, it's still a professional football game. I mean, I mean, how many? What's the lowest over under you would see for any NFL game? Probably just, maybe. Just 26. wait. Just wait for our game. Just wait for our yeah, game. Was, Jared. Well, it was <laughs> oh my Steelers. god, our, our game is going to set football back to the 1940s. No, Steve, no, no, that Steelers would be Tim Browns. Boyle versus Mac Jones, Week 18. That'll set football back. Uh, Steelers Browns. I think this. I think yeah, it's the same as your game, but Steelers 34 Browns. 34 to 33. 34 to th- 34 or 33, and Steelers Browns finished 13 10. So even when they set the total super low, it's still 100. Oh, it happens, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying from from like a line perspective, you, you typically would never see anything lower than the mid 30s. Yeah, no. yeah. And the only the only place I think you see below 30 is if it's in the Big Ten West. Um, but Sunday, the first game on the slate, I'm gonna say this game goes over. That is Houston taking on Jacksonville. 
We all know what happened earlier this year. I will say this right now, and I've been saying this for a while. If Houston makes the playoffs, D'Amico Ryan's 1,000% gets coach of the year. And C.J. Stroud, I don't know if I'm ready to say MVP for him, but definitely he is the guy in Houston right now. Why not? Who else is really good? Really? He would have to – I feel like they'd have to win the division and be like the one – like miraculously get to the one or get to the two seed for him to be in the MVP discussion. Yeah, I, I think that it does it does depend on where the team finishes, but I would say that among the playoff contending teams, he statistically is the best performing quarterback in the league this year. Yep. Um also the other thing I want to say too is I remember at the beginning of the season I saw a video of everyone, it was this trivia thing on TikTok, and they were going through, oh hey, name all the offensive rookies of the years from previous years in 2023. Everyone was just slotting in Bijan Robinson. And I like I like to say it on this hill that I was the one of the guys saying do not buy into Bijan Robinson immediately. They're putting way too much on him, and that might be coaching, and that might be other stuff. But I just like to say that. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good call for a guy like that, obviously coming in with really high expectations to underperform. I think that you know Jameer Gibbs was probably the one coming into the year where um, there may have been some that thought he was just going to come in and win the job right away. But I think a lot of people knew that they did just not make an investment. Yeah, not big rat, smart. I think that a lot of people did know that bringing in David Montgomery, the intent was to play them as a tandem. B. John is the one that really shocks me. This is entirely – the reason that the Falcons are not in first place in that division is entirely on Arthur Smith. I don't know what is going on, you know, in between game days during practices where he's looking at his team and goes, huh, Kyle Pitts. I think that we should target Janu Smith instead. B. John Robinson? Oh, I think that we should go 50-50 on the carries with Tyler Algier, despite the fact that he's getting half, half as many yards per carry week in and week out. Somehow this guy still gets the same amount of carries as B. John Robinson. I've got no idea what's going through this guy's head. He and when they, finally did, when they did give him the reins last week, what happened? He went off. Go figure. And to, to compound this, and I think, I think like, the non-fantasy football people might not know this, like – Truly, it's not just that they underutilize Kyle Pitts. Jonu Smith has scored more fantasy points than Kyle Pitts this year. Kyle yeah. Pitts is being outscored by another tight end on his own team. Jonu Smith, who could not have a role with the offense-starved Patriots for two yep. years. Mm -hmm. never I was waiting for his breakout. I was waiting for it. And Arthur Smith um, – Schemes up more touchdowns and passing opportunities for him over Kyle Pitts. It is it's, it is very strange. It's amazing. But back to this game though, Houston Jacksonville. I want to go Houston, but I, I think I gotta go Jacksonville here just because there was I don't know if you've seen this, but obviously Houston's have has this great history in Jacksonville, but it's the opposite where Jacksonville's just dominated them the last few years in Houston. So and also John, I'm gonna say this right now. I feel like that loss Jacksonville had to San Francisco is just what they kind of needed to like kick them in the butt and kind of say, hey, let's let's gear up and get ready. So I think this is the game where we kind of see how good truly Jacksonville is. Uh, yeah, I can kind of see it going either way. There's a reason the spread is one and a half. I mean, it's, it's just hard to predict. Like I, it's a division game, both teams. You know, it's really hard to sweep in the NFL. Like, I, yep. that's a, generally one of my betting truisms. Like, one, that's one of the reasons why I picked the Broncos to cover against the Chiefs. Not that I had the courage to predict that they would win outright, but when you play a team in your division twice in three weeks, maybe this is good for your Giants at the end of the year, playing a team twice in three weeks I feel like is a big advantage to the worst team because it all, all that can happen is it gives the worst team, like, a chance to maybe have a – better game plan the second time, maybe minimize that talent gap that exists with the shortened preparation and the fact that they play so close together. Uh, so it's really hard to sweep in the NFL. Uh, the Texans, Jaguars, Texans won the first time, so you kind of expect Jaguars to make it up. But this Texans team is really good. And let me tell you, it's, I don't think it's – it's not crazy. I think everyone acknowledges at this point. Which of these two quarterbacks has been playing better this year? It's Houston's. Like – I, it's not supposed to be Houston's. It's not supposed to be the rookie. But if you look at the numbers, yeah, it's Houston's. So I, I, I but I, I could see it going either way. Jacksonville's defense had this stretch where they were leading the NFL in turnovers. That obviously didn't show up against the Niners. But I'm hoping, you know, their chance to win is maybe if you see something like that. Because C.J. Stroud had three interceptions last week. So maybe if you get him to kind of start turning it over consistently in this game, maybe that's how Jacksonville. I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I think that this is just going to be one of those last team with the ball wins kind of shootouts. Like both defenses have been kind of suspect. I mean, Jacksonville, um, yeah, I mean, despite the advantages and turnovers, they've allowed a lot of offense throughout the season. And the Texans defense has been kind of a sieve as well. They've been winning the shootouts, right? The one thing that I'll point to for, you know, Texan over Jacks is that I think that Stroud has shown more consistency in spreading the ball around and using all of his receivers. We've seen Calvin Ridley has got to be the most annoying guy in the league for fantasy owners oh this year. God. The guy, hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. Christian Kirk he was looking early on like he was going to be kind of the, the consistent guy week in, week out. Jacksonville definitely has the talent all around, but we whereas – Every week you're seeing Stroud utilizing Nico, utilizing Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz, even Noah Brown, right? So Robert Woods, you know, there's something. Robert Woods too. Robert, yep, yeah, even yep, even Bobby Trees. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of I am leaning Jacksonville in this game, um, just because I think that I think with Houston being the younger team, I think that they're they're kind of due for that letdown week. You know, they've been they've been streaking for a little bit here. I think they, the, the two teams really do seem evenly matched uh, just based on the way that their season has gone over the last month or so. So either team could win wouldn't surprise me, but I would hammer that over. Whatever, whatever that over is, hammer it. This is going to be like a 28 to 24 game. Yeah, it's 40, it, they, they put it at 48.5 for a reason. They know they know points are coming. Oh, I, I'm, I'm seeing like I, – I feel like this could be like a 30, 35, 31 type deal. Take the over. That's all we have to say. Life's too short to bet the under. Uh, but the life's not too short to bet the under for Pittsburgh and Cincinnati in a game that's going to be disgusting. Uh, I'm going to go Pittsburgh here just because I feel like we're going to see a bit of a different offense now that Matt Canada has been fired, which who knew losing to Cleveland was the last straw, the straw that broke the camel's back, excuse me. So that's all That's all I got to say about this game. I, I, I think Pittsburgh wins. I just What I saw from Jake Browning last week on Thursday Night Football did not impress me one bit. It, it, good on Tomlin for realizing that I, I think this firing might have happened earlier, but Pittsburgh kept winning. And he didn't wait for, like, the multi-game losing streak. Like, as soon as their, like, regression loss happened, instantly fired. Like, not not going to wait until the record gets to 500. Not going to wait until the offense struggles. He developed good self-awareness to know our offense was bad even when we were winning. I was already holding it against him then. And so now that it finally cost them a loss, there's no more margin for error. Not going to wait anymore. Just going to do it right away. And I, I do kind of like that he told the press that, he didn't consult the GM or the owner. He just did it on his own, which is, you know, I mean, he's the head coach, but still it's, it's like a guy like Tomlin has the gravitas to do that. I don't think like Mike McDaniel can't just fire Vic Fangio without talking to Chris Greer about it. Like that, that would, that would never happen. So good on Tomlin for having that kind of aura for the organization to just unilaterally make the decision and have it help the Steelers offense. The Steelers, while they have been getting lucky, and they certainly have been, and they've been Russian candidates all year long. They got outgamed again by Cleveland. That's 10 straight games. They've been outgamed, outgamed to start the year. While all that is true, it should also be noted that not only should the scheme on offense improve, but they had Deontay Johnson on injury for a long time. And they also just got Pat Fryermuth back last week as well, who was also out for most of the year. And those two, look, even if they're not all pro players, they're good players and they're two of their best players. And having them both back, along with George Pickens, and with them finally starting to maybe consider giving Jalen Warren more work than Najee Harris. They actually did it last week, even though Jalen Warren like had 100 more yards than him. Their actual opportunities were still very similar, which was probably a mistake. And hopefully now you kind of maybe see that tilt a little bit in the other direction where Jalen Warren starts to get 60% of the work and Najee gets 40% rather than Najee getting the majority of the carries now. I think with all those factors, a new scheme, Deontay back, Pat Fryerman's back, Jalen Warren maybe getting more carries. I think their offense can play better. I think they can, even though they've been getting lucky, I think there's a world where they play better than they have been up to now. And maybe they don't, you know, only score 10 to 15 points every game. So we'll see. In terms of the game, I have no clue. It's a division game. It's a one-point spread. The, this is kind of the Bengals' season. They desperately need this win. It's in Cincinnati. I have truly no clue. Like, I, I will not try to predict this game. It can go either way. Yeah, I mean, I kind of – I lean Steelers. Um, I'll take new offensive coordinator over losing your starting quarterback. But um, it's uh, – yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, Big Red probably broke it down, uh, you know, better than I could have. Um, yeah, it's uh, 
it wouldn't surprise me either way that this uh, game winds up going, but um, I think that what we saw with Jalen Warren against the, I mean, what, what Jalen Warren did against the Browns defense, pretty impressive. So I uh, think that could carry over here and it's just, you don't know what you're going to get here without Burrow. Um, I mean, this, uh, it just, you just don't don't like uh, them picking them in a divisional game um, with that kind of a weakness, especially with the Steelers having a serious pulse in the playoff race. This is kind of a real make or break for the Bengals with how competitive that division is and how competitive the AFC wildcard race is. So I think that the Steelers bounce back from the loss against the Browns. And um, I, don't, I mean, will they win by how much? Uh, who's to say? But definitely don't like Cincy's chances with the, you know, without Burrow here. My, my 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 prediction is just throwing shit at a wall and hoping that it sticks. I'm not like like I'm like you, big rat. I don't know if it's gonna go. I'm just thinking Pittsburgh's gonna win. As for a score, I can see like 14 to six or something like that. Like this is not gonna be a pretty game of football. Like the next game, which is Tennessee versus Carolina, another low spread of three, not spread, but a lower over them, over under 36 and a half. Like this is the one where I feel like it could go over just because both defenses are just so bad to where it's just like we get. You know, like a weird, tw- like a twenty-one to seventeen, like football game where thirty-eight points are scored. You know, like just some. It's that game where you don't expect anything to happen, but then oh my god, something miraculously happens, or we get what happened last year with the Colts and the Broncos on Thursday night football, but buried in the one o'clock window on a Sunday. I am begrudgingly taking the Titans in Survivor this week. I do not love it. Yes, yes, I know. I'm not thrilled about it, but. I'm in, so I'm in a, I'm in a big Survivor League with my home pool, and there's only four of us left. Oh. There's only four of us left. But here's, this is the problem with Survivor League, as you can imagine. Everyone has burned the Chiefs. Everyone has burned the Cowboys. Everyone has burned the 49ers. Everyone has burned. I actually haven't mm. burned Baltimore yet. I haven't burned Baltimore yet, but I don't really love that this weekend against the Chargers. Uh, so the Titans. Quite obviously, never used them before in Survivor. They're at home. It's against a rookie quarterback. The Titans need this. I'm like, the Panthers need every game, but the Titans need this game. And it's at home. Their last two losses, they're coming off their losses against the Bucks and the Jaguars. Both those games were on the road. Both those games were not at home. If yeah. I had told you that I'm doing this after the Titans had beaten. Oh, the Steelers uh, lost two on the road. Yeah, exactly. So their last home game was that Falcons game where Will Levis threw the four touchdowns. If I had told you immediately after that game, I'm taking them in my Survivor League against the Panthers at home, you'd feel a little bit better about it. You'd feel even okay about it if I told you I'm taking it after they almost beat Pittsburgh on the road on Thursday Night Football. You'd still Mm -hmm. feel okay about it. We feel queasy because of how the last two weeks have gone. But I think the whole sample of Will Levis, four games, two of those games were still very good. The other two were very bad. But there's also only been one game at home, and the Titans are three and seven. Mike Vrabel is playing for his job. I understand so is Frank Reich. Everything I just said is also why this is a winnable game for Carolina, because all the same things apply to them too. I totally understand. But when you're in a survivor league in week 12, you have to take chances. And at this point of the season, you don't have many of the good teams available to pick. And so what am I going to do? Pick like the Cincinnati Pittsburgh winner? I, I can't figure that out. The, the Broncos at home against the Browns? No, thank you. And I guess I could pick the Ravens against the Chargers. Uh, we'll talk about the game in a second, but I think that's a good spot for the Chargers. So I'm going to take the Titans and Survivor. Ride with me, everyone. Let's see how it goes. Um, one yeah, I should be crucified for it. I mean, I think that uh, you mentioned some really good points. Like, yeah, would, would this sound so crazy if we were talking after the Pittsburgh game? I think that the, with the Titans, you don't get the – despite the record – You don't look at this team and think, oh, man, they're terrible. You look at them like, all right, they're not one of the better teams, but they're they're okay. You know, they've just – they've come up on the losing end more often than, you know, you might like for a team that you would regard as being decent. But Levis did flash against the Falcons, against the Steelers. I think that he's overdue for a decent game. Derrick Henry is overdue for a decent game. Derrick Henry is overdue for a Derrick Henry game honestly. So the, the Panthers, they've just, their limitations continue to show week in and week out. And yes, even bad teams win sometimes, but I would, I look at these two teams and I think the Titans are way more overdue for a win than the Panthers are. 
My take with this game also is the fact that the Titans are, I believe, they've won all three of their games at home this year, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure they're they're winless on the road away from Nashville. So that's the other reason why. You know what? Because I'll say this, too, for the whole job security thing. One, I, I hope Mike Rabel loses his job because I'd love for him to go coach somewhere else. And the other one being Frank Reich, I don't think, deserves the hot seat. I think David Tepper is just a very impatient man who needs to fuck off from the football operations side of things. I, I said that out loud. Um because David Tepper's trying to come in and run this like a business when, guess what, if you're an owner who tries to run a football team like a business, we've quickly seen that does not help your case at all. So for all those reasons, I think the Carolina Panthers are just a hot mess and they are the definition of mid. Um, but that's just my little soliloquy on it where I trust the Titans more. And also, too, it is Tractor Cito season after all. We are due for a Derrick Henry, like 120-yard game where he just – just trucks over someone as well. I'm trying to add lib because I forgot where the next game that I'm going to is, oh, which is coming will, up in a quick second. Before before we go to the game, I'll just say very quickly, Griff, you are correct. The Titans are undefeated at home, which is crazy for a three and seven team. That is crazy. But they are they're only their losses were on the road, and one of their home games was the London game. So that's yes. why they lost that quote unquote home game. But yeah, they beat the Chargers, they beat the Bengals, and they beat the Falcons, and they've not been at home since. So. Nope. Yeah. Let's, go. Let's go Titans, baby. Titans Nation. Let's ride. The next game came along on the, on the script on the little sub down below, and it is Atlanta hosting New Orleans. This is going to be a really exciting game because it's going to go a long way to determining who finishes where. But for as bad as the Saints' offense has looked, and both teams are coming off the bye week, I have to trust even Jameis Winston and how he looked against Minnesota more because I'm still not sure if Derek Carr is going to be playing. Last I heard, he still was in concussion protocol late last week. So for everything and how it goes, I, I, I just trust the Saints more. I can't trust De Desmond Ritter. I just don't know what Atlanta's doing. And a hot take that I've started saying on this podcast that came on here last week, but how does future Atlanta Falcons start Justin Fields' sound? Meh. Interesting. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, it, better than what they'll do as an alternative. That's I, I, uh, this game, I, I'm not going to like spend 10 minutes ripping Arthur Smith. We already did that earlier in the episode. I feel like that's covered. <laughs> so, uh, we already kind of established that. Uh, I, I'm going to go with the Falcons here. Um, I, I'm sticking with my preseason prediction, which is that the Falcons were better than the Saints. I feel like the Saints, Derek Carr. One might not play. It's not given yet. He has, he's in concussion protocol. They they are coming off their bye week, so you would expect both him are. to play. Both are, yeah. Both are coming off their bye week. I thought Ritter – Ritter, look, Ritter is not great for sure. But much like with the Packers, I've just never been convinced that he couldn't improve as the year went along. I feel like we were making definitive statements about how good he is with only like nine, ten starts in his career. Things change. There's no guarantee that they change. He can continue to be bad forever, for sure. That's football. But I'm not ruling out the possibility that things couldn't improve because I like this roster a lot. It's not managed very well, but I like this roster a lot, especially on offense. Like, I feel like they really need this game uh, more so than the Saints because it is in Atlanta. And they lose. They drop to four and seven, which even in the NFC South, you start to get behind the eight ball a little bit, um, especially if you let the Saints go to six and five. Uh, so I kind of feel like all is right with the balance of the universe if the Falcons win this game and then both teams are at five and six <laughs> and the division's still like up for grabs the rest of the year. So I'm going to quick Two quick sidebars about this game as well. They are celebrating 50 years of hip hop in Atlanta with a lot of big stars. I saw the list and I'm like 90% sure they are wearing the Dirty Bird uniform on Sunday as well. So that could be another takeaway for that as well. Just when it, And also too, I'm going to say this about this game quickly before we go to Jared. This game's either going to be like 30 to 27 or it's going to be like 17 to 14. I don't think there's any in between when it comes to the total. Uh, uh, this game is just, oh my gosh. It, is it, it's your game. This game just, both of these teams just have made my head spin all year long. I, th I feel like the, the Saints offense with, with Derek Carr um, hasn't lived up to expectations even like remotely close to what was promised at the start of the season. And I, I actually was of the camp of Carr was going to make this team better that, listen, like people crucified him in Vegas and Devontae Adams was getting plenty of production working with him. And it just, it's just not, it hasn't been clicking all season long with them. 
Um, you, you know, and Kamara has looked like mostly like a shell of his former self. And Atlanta, we've gone into the issues with Arthur Smith. These are just two mediocre teams that have the pieces to be so much more polished than they actually are. I think that either team could win. I, it, it's it, this game screams toss up to me. I feel like maybe Atlanta, I, they both just, they, I just see so much myth on both sides. There's nothing, there is nothing about either team that jumps at me to get excited about in this game to strongly lean one direction or the other. But I will say that if the Falcons are smart and they actually stick with B. John Robinson after what he did in the last game, then they should win. Because guess what? He's top five in the league. Tyler Algier stinks. Stop giving him the ball. One thing I will say, though, is that they did get carved by returning, who has looked pretty good since he's come back, and Kyler Murray. So that's one thing to point out there. The other thing, too, is when you have an Arthur Smith offense against a Pete Carmichael offense, your bleh makes complete sense. Because it's like even Saints fans, I think, are pretty tired of Pete Carmichael as well. And also, I'm going to say this right now, I think there's a very good chance that both these teams have new coaching staffs at the start of 2024. Um, next up, we have Indy versus Tampa Bay. I'm going to say this right now. I know the Colts beat the Patriots, but they did nothing to impress me. And the Buccaneers coming off a really bad loss. I I'm going Buccaneers here. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I actually considered the Bucs for Survivor. I think it's – even though they're a better team than the Titans, I think it's riskier because they're on the road. Yeah. Uh, and the Colts, are, the Colts are coming off the bye week. But I do agree with you fully. I, I think the Bucs are the better team. The Bucs are 4-6, and six, and the Colts are 5-5. Five and five. That does not seem right to me. I, I feel like with Gardner Minshew, a quarterback, it's impressive how Shane Steichen has kept the team together. They've been better than expected. The offense is actually, aside from the Patriots game, they, they were scoring 20 points, more than 20 points in every game this year, despite Anthony Richardson only playing that two That amazing games. game against Cleveland a few weeks ago. That, that shows you how good of a coach Shane Steichen is. Like, I've, I've long believed that Shane Steichen was a big part of Philly's offensive success last year, and you're kind of seeing it this year. Like, yes, Philly is still winning, but even Eagles fans will tell you their play calling is not the same in going from Shane Steichen to Brian Johnson. So Steichen also had Herbert – was Herbert's offensive coordinator his rookie year when he, like, took over the NFL and everyone was in love with Justin Herbert. And Herbert's numbers have dipped ever since Shane Steichen left the Chargers. I feel like he's a difference-making offensive mind. Having said that, uh, there's only so much you can go with a backup quarterback. The Bucs really need the game. I think Todd Bowles can kind of mess with Garner Minshew, similar to how he did with Will Levis. And I'm kind of expecting the Bucs to get a lot of sacks in this game, force a few turnovers, and I think they get a win that they desperately, desperately need. Um, I can't really see the Colts being 6-5 and five on the fringe of a playoff spot. So let's go Bucks. Yeah, this – I mean – the Colts have been the better performing offense this year. I think that these are two teams that it's similar stories with both of them where they were both kind of getting a lot of flack heading into the season. They were both like getting pegged as bottom of the league, bottom five. And I think that they've shown competency most, most weeks. The Colts have been in some surprisingly fun games and, and so have the Bucks. I think that Baker Mayfield has, you know, people thought that this was, you know, like his career was really going down the drain. And I think that, I wouldn't say he's shut anybody up, but I think that he's shown that, yeah, he could be a mediocre stopgap for one of these mid-teams in transition here. He, he's definitely developed some decent chemistry with Mike Evans. This game feels a little toss-uppy. It's really, it's just going to depend on if the Colts are able to get Taylor going. Like If this is, if this is going to be like the Jonathan Taylor game finally, where he just – you know, completely runs rampant and takes it over, then I could see the Colts winning. But, eh, I mean, I, I I think going in, you might lean Bucks. You know, you, you definitely, I think there's a reason to be a little bit more confident in Baker Mayfield over Gardner Minshew. But this is another game that it wouldn't surprise me in either direction. It's odd. You know, now you've got two mediocre teams, and I actually wouldn't mind seeing this game. Saints-Falcons, no interest whatsoever. Uh, this game, too, like, it, the Colts are in a weird position, too. Like, Darius Leonard just got released today. They do have the podcast's favorite wide receiver, Michael Pittman Jr., who's under who's having a pretty good year, low-key. He's, like, one of those, like, low-key guys having a really good season. Um, Josh Downs. Josh Downs, too. Josh Downs. Um, the Colts have some yeah. stuff there to where I'm, like, 2023, I'm not ready for you yet. It's the 2024 where I'm, like, this seems going to challenge for a playoff spot next year. I feel like they're kind of back to that, like, middle-of-the-pack status in the NFL. 
How about um, that shockingly decent AFC South division? It wasn't long ago that that was a complete uh, laughing stock. That was the toilet bowl. It was supposed to be the deploy- toilet bowl division for the last two, three years. Yep. Three teams, three teams at 500 or better in the AFC South. That is more than, like, I think all but, like, three divisions in the entire NFL. Like, it's been impressive. And next up, in one corner, you have the quarterback who lives at home eating chicken cutlets on a nightly basis versus another quarterback whose idiotic mistakes cannot escape him out of his way or a kid who tried to do a Dan Marino fake spike and threw into triple coverage for no reason in Frankfurt or the West Virginia prodigal son starting because I don't know what's going to happen. But the one thing I will say for this game is I don't care who wins because it's draft important for both these teams. But you know what? I'm going to stick with New England because Bill Belichick does one thing very, very good, even with his bad roster, and that's find a way to shut down rookie young quarterbacks. And also, too, it's the fact that Tommy DeVito is coming off a career day. I just don't see it happening again. All I have to say about this game, folks, is is if the Patriots win, it kind of helps my sanity in the short term. But in the long term, I would like Drake May or Marvin Harrison Jr. on my football team. And as well, my mental health just needs a victory Monday. My mental health for the love of Christ. Yeah, um, this uh, yeah, this, this game, you got two teams coming into the game with similar problems and two fan bases that really want anything but a victory here. The Giants defense has actually shown up throughout the season, um, really dating back to when this whole, like, you know, all the losing began. You know, I think that even in those games when they were allowing a lot of points, a lot of those were, it, it was either, you know, defensive touchdowns uh, by the other team or the offense just, you know, surrender it, putting us in awful field position. There have been only a couple of games this year where I, could, I mean, you point to the Dallas game, obviously, as a game where the defense got completely lit up and exposed. But most weeks, it, they've been losing more of those just ugly, frustrating, both teams sub-20 type of games throughout the season. And this game is shaping up to be just that, you know, all about that. So I do buy, I buy into the Bill Belichick against rookie quarterback narrative. I also buy into the Mac Jones has been really, really bad. And the Giants defense has been playing really, really good, you know, uh, lately. So, uh, I mean, I think it's going to be an ugly game. But, yes, I can definitely see DeVito regressing to the we can't run a play mode at times. This could be one of those games where the Giants have some opportunities to get ahead early but then they turn the ball over, set themselves back, kind of like that Seattle Monday night game. It actually might be a real good blueprint for this game. Yeah, I hope Belichick is coming for some Super Bowl revenge because the last thing I want is for this Giants team to boot themselves out of the top five by winning back-to-back games in this miserable, miserable season. One thing I'll say quickly is – um, with New England's defense, it has not looked the same since the Dallas game where, guess what, their sack leader got out. Matthew Judon has still been their sack leader for eight weeks now. So that's how bad the defense has been. The other point I want to make about this game as well is just, look, this game is like feels like the Giants-Redskins game from 2019, week 16, if you remember that game well. One o'clock game, both teams were like, th- it was like 3-12 and 12 against 3-12. and 12. It was just, and I believe the Giants pulled off an overtime win, which then got the Redskins got Chase Young. You guys got Andrew Thomas, which kind of worked out better for you guys because Andrew Thomas has truly been one of the better left tackles in football. But as for this game, I just I just see a world where the Patriots win just because there are so many question marks. There's all this stuff considering, look, they had the Buffalo win, but then Miami beat them. They lost to Washington, and they could barely get out of their own way in Germany. Um also, one other take I want to have for you guys when it comes to the draft. I think there's a very solid argument that Marvin Harrison Jr. could go number one overall. I don't think he will, but I think there is a very solid argument behind it. There's a very specific way that happens. If the Cardinals get the first overall pick and decide they want to keep Kyle Perry, that's how I think it happens. Or and the Bears. Assuming, or the Bears. Well, yeah, I guess that's also possible. It's just that with the Bears, because they have two firsts, It'll get kind of weird, like you know, like like they can maybe leverage those two picks or something crazy, like elsewhere in the draft. But yeah, I, I, I can I can see that as an option. I can see the Giants also. Jerry may not like this, but his team did it two years ago, and it's kind of helped them so far in the short term. Kayvon Thibodeau's look really good. Evan Neal still is a very much a work in progress. 
but the Giants could very easily to move back to look ahead and mortgage, not mortgage their future, but like look ahead to ensure their future because we know next year that Daniel Jones will be the starting quarterback because I just don't see a world where someone takes on that contract or Joe Shane's willing to eat. I don't know what the dead cap is, but I can't imagine it's pretty high. Greg's in Disneyland right now. Otherwise, we'd consult him, Big Rat. Uh, I'm rooting. I, I got the Patriots, by the way. Um, I'm just excited to watch the game. Rooting for the Patriots, big time. Getting my diehard Patriots fans on. I am kind of perversely curious in this quarterback thing with New England because, as you know, uh, Griff, I follow some of the Boston Herald guys and Greg Bedard from Boston Sports Journal and all those people. And I'm genuinely fascinated who they're going to start because, uh, I, I, like, do you what do you who, what do you think and who do you want to start? Um, you I, would, I would like to see Greer because it's like, what other options you have? Because I'll say this, Bailey Zappi, you cannot play him. That's, that's done. Bailey Zappi is done. Ultimately, I think it's going to be Mac. I just can't see a world where they give up on him. And I've said this before and I'll say, I said this last time you were on with all the AFC East boys. Mac is the answer short term just because I don't know what else there is. But long term, it's, it's not him. I want, there's three quarterbacks that I'm eyeing for New England right now. That is Jaden Daniels from LSU. That is Drake May and Michael Penix Jr. So if they were to end up with one of those three, I'd be fine. Like, say if they wanted to go and draft Marvin Harrison with a third overall pick, I would be okay with it if they want to take a quarter, if Jaden Daniels in the second round, because I don't think Jaden Daniels is a first round talent. Not like not top 10 talent, because I've been even seeing some weird mocks too, like where Bo Nix is going number five, which Jared, if the New York Giants do that, that would be no, just no, do not do that. I don't know why I saw Bo Nix as a top five draft pick. But it's like this whole weird world with what I want. Like I, like I just could see New England winning this game too. Because like I said, nothing about Super Bowl revenge, but just more or less, it's that desperate team in a desperate spot, and New York coming off just this huge high of a win. I, I, I also, uh, I, I could see it either way. I, I, you get the kind of feeling that the bye week maybe helped Mac a little bit, like almost like if you had to play a game immediately after what happened in Germany. I just think, like, the tensions were high, like, in the locker room, and the fan base to, like, really want to change. And when you give them that bye week, it's like people have short attentions. Like, obviously, it's still a big topic in New England. But I feel yeah. like the intensity of the emotion of, bench him now, like, dissipates a little bit when you have, it, like, that week to cool off. It, it honestly has. It, like, some of the reporters are still talking about it throughout the bye week. Like, I know guys like Mike uh, Cadlick, Doug Kyatt, uh, all those guys have still been really on it, which – Big Rad, I don't know if you saw, but we uh, – because we talked about it originally about his personal situation away from football, but his daughter's – I know you're saying a very tough fight, but she's out of the hospital now. I just didn't know if you were aware of that or not. But, yeah, that's that's all I see for this game. It's just nothing else. This is going to be a gross, like, 13 to 10 or, like, fucking 7 to 6 football game. There's not there's, – there's no way both teams are scoring more than 15 points. I will, I will say this just to add on to the whole, like, you know, will Daniel Jones be back next year? I mean – I don't, I don't know what's going through ownership's heads, but I mean, I just think that like, if we finish with a top five pick, how do you not take a quarterback at this point? Like, listen, I, I know that he's under contract, but you know what? Like, suck it up. Own the it's mistake. more the money than the contract. That's my yeah, thing. But, right. But, you know, you can just, you can have him on the roster and wait out this contract, create the competition, bring in a rookie. How are you not exploring your options if you have a top five pick at this point? Like, Daniel Jones is not the wor- he's not the worst thing in the world, and I know that I flip flop on this guy constantly. But I mean, this season, like at this, you're point, the one Giant fan that I know that does. So many Giants fans have like bought in it and bought it into him. I mean, I was I was ready to buy in. I was ready to buy in after last year because I had a whole. I will, I'll I'll just say it right now. This was my vision for this season. I thought that okay, the offensive line is now developing. We are now gonna have like a you know we're, we're finally building a solid foundational unit because you know if evan neal comes along you know we got a good center now um maybe this is going to be a decent line now we added some weapons we can open up some deep bombs to jalen hyatt uh waller's gonna be a reliable target it's all gonna be hunky dory and then andrew thomas getting hurt and our whole offensive line falling apart that is unacceptable that that cannot happen i understand that his talent is drastically disproportionate to the rest of the guys on the line, but you can't have a team that fu- that is set up like that. And Jones, I'm sorry, but under pressure, under more pressure, Tyrod Taylor performed better. Tommy DeVito had a freaking decent game. Okay, I, I know it was against the Commanders, but he had a decent game, and Jones looked 
completely hopeless back there. You know, it's not working. You have it's we've seen enough. It's been enough years at this point. You got a chance to get a top five pick, get to get in a you know a top level top quarterback prospect. It's time to rip this up. It is time to start completely new. The Jones Barkley era didn't work. Stop trying to make it work. You can't keep putting band-aids on this gaping wound that requires stitches. So one of two things. One, I just think that John Mara's loyalty goes a little bit further than it should. That's one thing I think yep. I think as well. That's why Eli was with the Giants for as long as he was. Um, I'll never go on the whole Eli Hall of Famer. He's he gets two Super Bowls and two MVPs. That's just it's a lock. Mm -hmm. Um the other thing too is, and I want to ask you this because I'm starting to think this. I don't think you re-sign Saquon Barkley this offseason. I think you let him – you let – basically, here's the thing. you got to get the Gettleman guys out. Yeah. Uh, excluding I, I, Andrew Thomas. Excluding Andrew Thomas for obvious reasons. But a lot of the Gettleman guys, I think they have to – like you got to get that new regime and let Joe Shane bring in his guys. I also don't see a world – I know everyone's saying all these reports like, oh, their jobs are safe. Daniel Jones will be back next year. I just don't see a world where – one bad season is a result for firing. That's something that dysfunctional teams do. You guys, look, the Giants haven't had a good year, but they're not dysfunctional like the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, I, Aaron I, Tish, I trust yeah. more than David Tepper. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely don't think that this is – we've had a lot of bad Giants teams over the last few years where people are calling for the coach's head, and rightfully so. Yes, it is possible to hire the wrong coach repeatedly. Yes, the Giants did hire multiple bad coaches in a row. I don't think that this is really a situation where people are calling for Dayball's head. I mean, do I think Mike Kafka is going to take the heat? I don't think that there's any way around that because you have one of the worst, statistically one of the worst offenses in recent NFL history. I had higher hopes for him after last year. Hell, we thought we were going to lose this guy. A lot of people thought that Kafka was, he was possibly a goner this offseason. He was interviewing for head coaching gigs. So I don't think that people are calling for Dayball's head. I definitely don't think he's going to get fired. I don't think that – I think that you look at the Giants and you just think that this is a personnel issue, that they just have an untalented offensive roster that needs to be overhauled. And Joe Shane has not been given really the gloves fully off. Like Dave Gettleman had a lot of resources at his disposal. And what he did was – he put this team in such a horrible financial position that everybody knew it was going to take a few years to climb out of this. Going back to the Saquon point, I would agree about not re-signing him. However, I think that that Mara loyalty, he is hung up on that guy being a career giant. And after his multiple injuries and the running back market being what it is, they might actually wind up with more leverage than they had last year. So I could see Saquon back on a team-friendly deal it's just the, the value for running backs, it is what it is. And I would welcome the guy coming back if it was affordable, even though I stand by the belief that if you get fresh legs, you got to build that offensive line. You build the offensive line and you can find fresh legs. The good teams, the teams that are really good at running the ball, it's kind of a plug and play. Like they get production out of a lot of different guys. I, I was going to – very. I thought that was a very interesting conversation you guys were having there. And I wanted to say on Dable and on Saquon. So on Saquon, just a piece of information. Uh, Mike Garofolo uh, was on the Around the NFL podcast a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about the Saquon situation. And he's like, you know, New, his, most of his contacts are like New York and Philly. The Giants, the Jets, the Eagles, that's like most of his insider stuff, as opposed to Ian, who's more of a national NFL insider. And he said that it's interesting with the Giants and Saquon because – they were very, very close, apparently. Very, very close before the franchise tag deadline of, of extending him. They were very close. Garofalo even said that he thought it was going to happen. It was that close. And then you think, okay, they don't agree on money, so maybe they'll trade him since he's in the last year of his deal. But Joe Shane was apparently like adamant, we're not trading Saquon, it's not going to happen, etc. So they're in this unique spot where they don't want to break the bank for him, but they also like value him very, very highly. And so... You do kind of wonder, like, kind of what Jared was saying, like, maybe the loyalty thing is playing into this too. And clearly, like, ju just because they didn't extend him last year doesn't mean they don't think highly of him because they were close on the extension and they refused to trade him, even though he could walk this year. So it does kind of make you think, kind of seems like they're heading towards coming back on more of a team-friendly deal, on more of a, you know, 
I've always said for years on the show, the Derrick Henry contract was a great running back contract. Like he got four years, 50 million. Only the first two years were guaranteed. So like if he fell off a cliff, kind of like how he's doing now, like a year ago, they could have just cut him. No problem. No harm, no foul. They paid him for the 2020 and the 2021 seasons when he was still good. And then there was no guarantees the last two years of the deal. And because he was playing well enough, they kept him around anyways. And Derrick Henry ended up seeing the whole contract and getting his full $50 million. So maybe that's a good middle ground with Saquon where you guarantee two years, give him his money, and then kind of keep him motivated. Like have him play like he's on a contract year, even though he's not, with the sense of this guarantee is high for a running back. We will cut you if you're not playing well. And maybe that gets him to extend his career a little bit in years three and years four. Um, Hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. I definitely think that it's time. I mean, I think you can do that. Um, but I think it's definitely time to get a legitimate number two running back and start, I think, shifting to more of a committee approach. Just his health at this point is a concern. It's happening on a pretty much an annual basis. Last year he was healthy and he was amazing. But this year, you know, he's missing time. And he said publicly that it's, you know, it's been lingering. This is this type of injury. Like it's, you know, he's not really, he still feels it. So I think that you look at what other t- other successful teams in the league yeah. are doing. Um, it's just, it's not the era of the bell cow back anymore. It's just, it's yeah. not, you know, unless you get, you get a guy like Christian McCaffrey that can literally do it all. That's great. But, you know, Saquon, you know, not being able to stay on the field um, for, throughout most of his career is uh, making that not feasible. So yeah, he's kind of, and he, he like you were saying he's he's kind of a unicorn in that role, separate from like CMC. Like even the Titans, Tajay Spear gets, gets the ball a lot. Uh, the obviously like the Steelers we were talking about earlier, they basically have a full split. Even a mm-hmm. team like the Colts, like Jonathan Taylor carries the ball a lot, but Zach Moss is still getting a lot of carries. The Eagles yep. give the ball to three backs. The Dolphins give the ball to two to three backs at all times. Like there's kind of really he's kind of on an island in that way. Like Austin Eckler basically shares the ball with Josh Kelly at this point too, for that same kind of reason. And Austin Eckler, even on his podcast said, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with getting less carries if it preserves my body for the long term." He did not take that as like a personal affront to his ability as a running back. He said, I want this. I support this. So they got yeah, it. We so kind of had our- interesting too. Yeah. The, 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 I just want to, sorry, Jared, but the, the Austin oh. Eckler one's interesting because remember he had the trade request in the off season as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that we kind of – our running back committee last year was with Jones, essentially, because Jones was getting us a consistent, like, 10 to 12 carries a game and was usually picking up some serious chunk yardage at that. So you combine that, the Giants' running game was consistently um, a threat to generate as much as 200 yards per game. So that was the committee. But it is definitely very, very interesting that, that Saquon's entire tenure – we have, you know, we've had Matt Breida for a few a few touches a game. That's it. And I, th- I think the Dable, to your point on Dable, I think a, a game like what happened Sunday, I think is massive for him, like, not getting fired. Mm-hmm. Like, I've been, I've been, I've and I've admittedly been on the show saying, hey, if they just, like, flame out and go 2-15 and 15 or whatever, like, and they're getting, they were just getting blown out so badly every week, losing by, like, 80 points to the Cowboys. It's like. You have to have like a level of dignity and a level of competitiveness. And him, he has those two games with Tyrod Taylor in his back pocket where you should have beaten the Bills on the road, nonetheless, and then had that game against on Sunday Night Football and had the game against the Commanders the first time. He had those two games in his back pocket. And then now with that Tommy DeVito game, that's kind of his calling card to the organization of, look, I'm adding something to this team. Look what these quarterbacks are doing with a not great roster. They're playing better than the original starter was. Like this is the kind of, good things I can do as an offensive mind. And I feel like that goes a long way towards him keeping his job. Meanwhile, I just want to ask, before we wrap up and go to the four o'clock window with new England, even though a win on Sunday would be good for the organization. I just think long-term that it's just, it, this is broken. Beyond, I think it's just, it's broken beyond repair. It's just one of those things where it's just, it's, it's time to move on. Like I, I love my day. I love, I love the days. I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the season. It's, it's going to be emotional no matter what, but it's just, it, it feels like the end, the end is coming. Up next, all. R.I.P. Um, uh, yeah, uh, up next, a uh, game that I'm going to call game of the week, potentially, in the Denver Broncos and the Cleveland Browns. Two teams really? who are very, very good at the moment right now. But when it comes down to the brass tacks of things, 
I want to go Cle- – I'm going to go Cleveland just because of defense. I feel like at the end of the day, which defense do you trust more? Even though I will say this, Pat Sertan has become one of my favorite corners in the NFL. I'm going Cleveland. I'm going Denver. I am going to – I have a very simple stance. I am going to dare Dorian Thompson-Robinson to win two straight games. A game last week that they won by scoring 13 points. He had 112 passing yards, 3.8 yards per attempt. It was not that much better than his start against the Ravens that was, like, historically terrible. Like, it still wasn't great. And I am just kind of basically da- – and the Broncos' defense, whether this is sustainable or not, they're causing turnovers every week. They beat the Vikings and the Bills because they force like, three to four turnovers out of both teams. I don't know if you can do that every week, but can you do that against Dorian Thompson-Robinson? Probably on a sack fumble or, like, some bad interception. So I don't – no doubt the, Bron- the Browns' defense is elite. The Browns could win this game with their defense. The Browns could turn over Russell Wilson. All those things are true. I do not deny that at all. My stance will be I will dare Dorian Thompson-Robinson to win two straight NFL games in a row because I'm not sure he can do that. I really think that, I mean, beyond the Dorian the Dorian Thompson thing, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously that's a disadvantage. But I think that what's bigger here is that we're still, you know, dealing with a second-tier running back core compared to Denver's, which – when, you know, I, I feel like we haven't seen fully, you know, McLaughlin and Javante cooking at the same time. Um, kind of like, you Samaj know, with, with the line. Was that? Samaj P. Ryan, though. P. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Sneaky. Um, so I think that with this game, you know, it should be a grinded out. Like both, both teams obviously defensively have the ability to make – the opposing quarterback's life very difficult here. It's worth the, I mean, obviously Russell Wilson has the experience edge, but let's not, you know, um, avoid the fact that he's had a lot of ugly showings this year and, and obviously, you know, last year as well. And he obvious he has absolutely has shown the capacity to completely crap out and really not get anything going through the air, especially against the Cleveland defense, which is really good. That's how they're going to be able to win this game is by forcing turnovers. Both teams have the ability to create turnovers there. I don't I don't think that this is going to be terribly high scoring. Most people would say the same. And I just trust the running back duo in Denver more than I do the one in Cleveland. So I think that that's what it's going to give them the edge here. It's not going to be a fun game to watch. It's going to be, I think, a lot like that. Like that Patriots-Giants game is going to be one of those, uh, you know, 1950s era football games where you, this might see a really, really low number of pass attempts from both teams. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Rams and Cardinals, like, I look, I look at this game. I'm like, I don't care. It's a pick em game. I'm not sure why. I like, I'm going to go with the Rams, though, just because simply they're, I think, the more trustworthy team. I feel like with Atlanta, not Atlanta, Arizona. Arizona got their one win against Atlanta where it was like, yeah, hey, they're this, and then they're just kind of regressed to the meat. There's part of me that wanted to pick the Cardinals this week. Um, I, I just think this Rams team is kind of up and down. Like, I – I always like I, they're probably the team I've the commanders were the team I've gotten the most right from a betting perspective. They're the team I've gotten the most wrong. Like uh, so many, I actually didn't take them against the Cowboys because I'd been burned by them enough times by that point that I kind of realized, no, the Cowboys are going to destroy them. The Cowboys destroy everybody, man. Like they're really, really good. And I was like, I, I cannot take the Rams anymore because I took them against the Eagles and I took them a few other times like earlier in the season. And I, I finally got sick of it. I was just like, I can't keep betting this team. Like they're not, I thought they would be a nine and eight, eight and nine team, like all these other mediocre NFC teams we always talk about. But I yeah. kind of start to wonder: are they are they worse than that? Are they seven and ten? Are they six and eleven? Like they were really bad last year, and they're just not so consistent. And like Stafford, it feels like Stafford can have a season-ending injury any week at this point. Like it just it, it wouldn't Possibly surprise career. me at all. Like it's yeah, and especially like he's got this thumb thing now, and he's taking such bad hits. Like every game, he gets like destroyed on like a really mm-hmm. bad stock. That and like I, the running game is relying on Jags and Royce Freeman and Darrell Henderson. I know it's been effective, but I just I don't know if that's sustainable model week to week. Now Cup is hurt as well. I just think I just think they're not ready. I think they burned all their draft picks and their salary cap space trying to win that Super Bowl. They got it. Banners fly forever. No regrets. It is what it is. And then now you're kind of starting to see the roster was top heavy last year. They traded Jalen Ramsey, which made it worse. And they kind of are relying on – because they have no draft picks, they were relying on a lot of low-drafted players, UDFAs, like on their offensive line and in their defense. 
And I just feel like, especially not that this matters against the Cardinals, but against a lot of teams that are good in the trenches, they just stand no chance. Like they stand no chance if you're facing a team with a really good O-line, D-line combo because their trenches are just so raw and inexperienced. So the Cardinals, the Rams like should win theoretically. They should stay in the playoff race. But look at it from the Cardinals' perspective. If there was a game the Cardinals could win this year, isn't this the game? Isn't this the game at home where they have like the best chance to like steal a win? But I, I don't quite have enough faith. I feel like Kyler last week started to have some bad plays. Like I think people are going to start to realize as good as Kyler is, the team around him is so bad that I don't know if he alone can carry them to be 500 the rest of the year because of the other limitations. So in the Rams, so I think the Rams will probably win. But don't be surprised if Arizona this week. If Arizona were to trade Kyler Murray in the offseason, apart from Jared's game prediction, where could you guys see him going? Atlanta, uh, Pittsburgh, Green Bay outside, Minnesota, Minnesota, I could say. Uh, Yeah, there's a few spots. I guess the Giants, maybe. (laughs) I mean, you'd rather use a draft pick, but that's not us. That that's not us right now. We're we're not a quarterback away. We need like a whole offensive overhaul, man. Like we're not we're not in a position to, to trade for a veteran quarterback. Well, here, here's an option for you. If Will Levis, if Will Levis like just like starts tanking the rest of the year, kills me in Survivor, starts playing bad every week, and they give up on him because he was a second round pick, not a first round pick, he's not guaranteed to have that job next year. It, it is not his divine right, especially if he's not playing well and they pick up the top of the draft. So yeah. maybe on a team you know that has like a lot of older players on defense and Mike Vrabel like kind of playing for his job, maybe he prefers. You know what? I'm tired of drafting Malik Willis and Will Levis. And picking like the third or fourth best or fifth best quarterback in the draft because it's unlikely they'll be so bad that they get the top two. So maybe he just kind of goes, We're moving on from Tannehill, anyways. I'd rather get a veteran in here than bring in another young quarterback. And, you know, he's got the mobility that Tannehill had when they were having success a few years ago. He's more more mobile, obviously. Yeah, Kyler Murray and the DeAndre Hopkins playing together. Uh, uh, That's a novel idea, isn't it? (laughs) Never been done before. And Jay, were you going to say something on the Rams Cardinals game? Oh, the Rams cards, yeah, ugly game. I want to say that I think the Rams, like, it really was kind of fool's gold with them, and you know, early in the season before those injuries hit. I mean, really losing Kyron Williams, I think, just made this team so one-dimensional. When he broke out, you were like, "Whoa, we might have something here." Puka Cooper, kind of similar to you know Cooper and Robert Woods when those guys were cooking at the same time a few years ago. And I mean, like early on, you thought that, wow, you know, when they get like they get cut back in there, you got two guys that might might both be good for 10 balls, 100 plus every week. But yeah, that team just thin. I'm I'm leaning Arizona. I I agree with what you said that like, hey, they got to win one week, right? Might as well be this one. Fair, fair, fair points, gentlemen. Fair points. Uh, Philadelphia, Buffalo, I have. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're going to the game. I'll just say very quickly. Both of you and your fan bases uh, probably also want Arizona to win. You know, probably <laughs> better for the loser. Fair, the I think so. uh, dirty bird, uh, bird gang all the way. Um, Rams and not Rams. Fuck, I'm so confused now. Bills. Eagles and Bills. I got two things to say about this game. Um, I'm not ready for the three-hour suck fest that comes from Tony Romo and Josh Allen. Hmm. And it's another Kelly Green game. I, Buffalo looked really – I think Buffalo's back. But I'm not fading Philadelphia in those Kelly Green uniforms. No, sir, I am not doing it. I think I'm I already have parlays for Thursday and Sunday, by the way, just to do this podcast. Philly's got to lose. They're overdue. This, this is bet. the least impressive 9-1 and one team ever. No, and you know what's going to happen? I, yeah, I know what's going to happen. They're going to have a convincing win against the Bills this week, and then they're going to get their butts whooped by San Francisco next week. And then that's that doubt where everyone's like, maybe that. All right, maybe maybe that's the game. We got to wait. We got to wait. Yeah. This game matters to Buffalo, though. This is like we're getting to that point of the season where, like, you know, they the losses that they incurred early on. There's not a lot of room for error if they want to catch the Finns and have a chance at the division. I just feel like. You know, yeah, should Philly win? Are they the better team? Yes, but I I just feel like Buffalo needs it more, and Philly is 
They're overdue for a loss. It should come against a good team that should be hungrier here. Yeah, they, they, they're very much big time. Like, they can't keep getting away with it, energy. Mm-hmm. Like, they, <laughs> like, because they've won so many of these close games, I think some people are foolishly, like, talking themselves into, like, there's, like, a thing there where they have this formula where they just win these games. And I've always on this podcast called that nonsense because, like I said at the top, like, they don't cause MBS to drop that pass. They contribute nothing to the outcome of that play. And if the Chiefs score that touchdown, I think they're winning that game because the Eagles' offense was so bad in that game. They had two productive drives the entire game that wasn't gifted by turnovers. Every other drive was a three and out. They needed big plays to get all their scoring touchdowns, like the underthrown bad ball to Devonta Smith. Yes, Danny, learn football. And, yeah. and that, in the fourth quarter of that game, they also needed like a DeAndre Swift, like 20-yard run to score their first touchdown earlier in the game. They – Hurts has been – Terrible in the two-minute drill his whole career. Been telling Danny this for three years now, and he still doesn't understand. He literally, against the Jets, the game they lost, not only did he throw the horrible interception, but then they had a two-minute drill that was an immediate three and out, four and out, I guess, because Hertz tries to scramble in the two-minute drill because he's so dependent on that. And when he can't, because the clock doesn't allow him to do that, and he's not fast enough like Lamar to break like a 60-yard touchdown run, that ends up really hurting his team when he plays like that. Uh, I think Hurts' pocket present is not good. I feel like the Eagles, because they have the best offensive line in football, you rarely get to see it because he's always protected. But you saw in that game yesterday, when Chief guys were close, he would start to turtle. He would start to prematurely scramble. And there are so many times where he does that, and it kills the passing concept. They would show, oh, Devonta Smith and Agent Brown are open down the field, but Hurts prematurely left the pocket. And now it's like a four-yard rush punt. So I also am frustrated with this Eagles team. I need them to win this game, <laughs> unfortunately. As, it pains me, but as a Dolphins fan, I need the Bills to lose this game. If the Bills lose this game, I think the Dolphins will win the division. I'll be very direct about that because I think Buffalo yeah. won't have – because Buffalo still has to go at Kansas City too, and they still have to come to Miami Week 18. And I feel play like Dallas. Also, and they play Dallas. If they lose this game, I feel like it's just one too many for them to make up because the Dolphins – beat the Broncos, they did not. The Dolphins beat the Patriots in New England, they did not. If the Dolphins win on Friday, they'll have won in New York when Buffalo did not. Like, we were tied. In a, the, the games that the Dolphins have lost, the Bills haven't played yet. The Bills haven't played Philly and Kansas City yet, like the Dolphins have. So if they also lose those games, because we made up the games that they lost, I think it'd be impossible for them to come back. So I fucking hate it. It's driving me crazy. I also hate the Seagulls team. But – like Griff was saying, they play 49ers, they play the Cowboys. I, I wouldn't surprise me if the reverse of what Griff said happens, where they lose this game. Everyone kind of predicts San Francisco to upset them the next week, seeing them lose to Buffalo. And then they actually kind of rally at home and beat San Francisco because they rarely lose at home two straight games. And then everyone will falsely think their problems are solved and they're back to being that dominant like 10-2 and two team. And then they go at Dallas and lose at Dallas, which I think they will do because they should have lost to Dallas the first time. And the rematch is in Dallas. Definitely think Dallas would beat them then. So the I, one I, thing, I, I'm expecting one and two over these next three weeks in whichever order. Um, the one thing I was going to say, too, is for this game, one bet I really like is that over. I got to see the ticker again if it's at 46 or 47. But this, this I think that we're going to get a very similar game here, what we've seen with uh, that Philadelphia-Dallas game. The other thing I'll say about Buffalo, too, is is I know we kind of all were like, not saying it was over, but it was more about WTF. This all kind of goes to show that um, maybe we should have seen the Ken Dorsey blow up in Miami as a bigger red flag than a lot of people took it as. It's just a funny little clip where the 48 and a half. But, yeah, that's the thing with the Ken Dorsey thing where I'm just like, you, 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 you can't do that. I think it was too buddy buddy. I think that's what that's ultimately what happened was. But moving on now, one question for you guys. It was on the ticker all day. Vegas minus nine. That was my fault. It was Vegas plus nine. Do the Chiefs cover nine points against the Raiders in Las Vegas? Nope. Yeah, I'm the same. I I have huge trust issues with Kansas City on the spread. I have since 2020. Kansas City has not scored more than 20 points in six of their 10 games this year. This is not a high-powered offense. This is a solid offense that is being a little inflated because of their like great day against the Chargers a few weeks ago, which was at home. It's a solid offense, but an elite defense. And I think that it's really hard for a team like that, that on average will score 18 to 20 points, 
it's hard to cover a nine point spread when that's how many offensive points you're going to score. I expect, yes, Mahomes will have some sort of resilient bounce back. I totally understand that. And I understand that Aiden O'Connell might struggle against this defense, but at home in Vegas, Vegas really, really going to be playing with a lot of energy. I think Kansas City will win, but I just, I want to see them win a game by double digits before I expect it to happen. Because, too, they have Kansas City coming up. I was looking at – it was actually today I was listening to Pro Football Talk, and they're going over their schedule for the rest of the year. They play the Raiders twice. They play the Packers, Char- the Chargers, the Bills, the Patriots, and a game that was supposed to be big but isn't anymore in the Bengals in Week 17. So I feel like in all but one of those games, they're going to be a favor. They're going to be favored. I feel like it – could be next week when we get the jock sniffing Chris Collinsworth calling Patrick Mahomes game. But ultimately this week, you called it a few weeks ago, Big Rat, on the podcast when I was so confident on Kansas City on survival, which knocked me out when they played Denver. This is a game I feel like Vegas will get up for because they know a rival's coming into their building. Antonio Pierce has this new like just sense of confidence installed into them to where – this game's going to be ugly, but I feel like as long as Aiden O'Connell doesn't do anything stupid, they're going to keep it close. I think that the Chiefs do cover, and I will point to last year. Last year, it was uh, just about the end. Of, I think it was like maybe the second to last game of the season. Um, Chiefs went to Vegas. Well, it was week 18. Hmm? It was week 18. Week eight, oh, it was week 18. There you go. So they blew them out. They won by 18 points. And in that game, Patrick Mahomes only threw for 200 yards. So, and it was, you know, similar situation. Jarrett Stidham was starting for the Raiders, just like Aiden O'Connell is going to be starting this time. And Chiefs now have chip on their shoulder after blowing this game against the Eagles. I think that this Raiders team, yes, are, are they a little rejuvenated after the whole Josh McDaniels thing went down? Yes. However, the Chiefs need a get-right game, and they showed against the Bears earlier this year that when they want to, they can pound a team into submission. And I think that after after blowing that throw to um, you know MBS uh, with that whole you know blunder at the end of the game there, um, you know he could make up for it. Mahomes will have the opportunity to uncork some bombs here. I think that they're going to present themselves. Justin Watson was good against Philly. You know, they've shown a propensity to get him the deep ball in most games this year. Kelsey, you know, had a quiet game. He should rebound. I think that there, you know, this just feels like, you know, Kansas City needs a bounce back. And even if Mahomes doesn't throw for 400 yards, they still have the ability to win this game by double digits. I definitely... I definitely agree that I look, I as a better, because I'm probably going to be taking the Raiders in the Fat Five this week. I'm afraid of the Chiefs, you know, bounce back, resilient, kind of like the the 49ers, you know, against Jacksonville. We've lost three straight games. Now it's time to roll up our sleeves and start kicking some ass, like mm-hmm. to, to get back revenge. I guess my stance, we'll see who's right. We don't know yet. I just don't think this is the same Chiefs team. Like yesterday, when the Eagles punted that ball, uh, Benjamin Solak, who writes for The Ringer, who's an Eagles fan, wrote, like, oh, man, it's so sad. I'm a fan of a team that punted the ball back to Patrick Mahomes. And, like, in my group chat, like, a friend shared that tweet. And I was just like, yeah, but you also punted it back to those receivers. Like, it's not – like, I really – like, I, it's easy to say in hindsight after seeing MBS drop that ball. But I didn't trust them to get the game-winning touchdown in that spot. Like I probably normally would have the last like four years, Mahomes with the ball, two and a half minutes at home. This is where magic happens. And I was just kind of like, it's just not that team. Like when they lost to the Lions in week one, they had a million drops, right? Didn't the game look eerily similar to the game you saw yesterday? And Travis Kelsey played. And mm-hmm. I, But no I was, Taylor and, Swift in the crowd. No Taylor Swift in the crowd, which is obviously a statistical correlate at this point. And I, I, I just wonder, you know, they lead the NFL in drops of any team in the league. Not the Jets, not all these teams with bad receivers. Like, it's the Chiefs. What if this is just who they are? What if they will struggle to put up 24 to 30-point games moving forward because of how limited these receivers are? I agree that Watson is playing better. Really, their answer, I mean, I'll give you credit. Well, well, Wat- yeah, I mean, Watson has kind of been a guy for, like, you know, one big catch a game for the most part. Like, he got – like that had to have been his season high in targets against – 
the Eagles last night. But I think that, you know, one main issue for them is technically their WR1 at this point is Rasheed Rice. And yeah. the issue with him is that all of his plays start at the line of scrimmage. He's They have not established that guy as a downfield target whatsoever. And you, you can't have a WR1 who can only – he can only run one play. Yeah. That, that's I, – I just think with Kansas City, they're, they're going to have a game where – they explode, but I feel like it's going to be a game where we don't see it coming. Like, I was saying this to myself today where I was like, they play the Patriots on Monday Night Football in a few weeks, and I'm not mentally ready for that game. One, because it's two days before my 30th birthday, and two, I think the Patriots are going to lose. But at the same time, I remember this where Bill Belichick has played Patrick Mahomes very well. So we'll see what yeah. happens there. The other thing I want to see, too, and this is what I feel like is Patrick's most underrated stat, is if he has to go on the road for a playoff game this year. Because remember this. He's never played a playoff game away from Arrowhead. Never once. I never once. I've used, I, yeah, not just that he's never won a road playoff game. He's never played a road playoff game. Now, like, I use this line all because, like, me and my friends in our group chat about the Dolphins, you know, it's a constant topic of consternation. Can the Dolphins really win a game on the road at Baltimore in the AFC title game, fourth quarter game on the line? And Week I was like, 17, we'll find out. We'll see. Indeed, they did. They did win at Baltimore last year. But the broader point I'm trying to make is the road team usually doesn't win in the playoffs. Like Brady, I saw a stat that I think Brady only won like three road playoff games all those 19 years in New England. Like the Patriots and Chiefs often went to the Super Bowl when they often had home fields. Like usually that's how it goes. So it's, it's if you play at home, you don't need to prove that you can win on the road against a great team. Just beat them in your building. Like, Brady was 0-3 in playoff games in Denver, for example. His first ever playoff loss was in Denver. Uh, Indianapolis, he did not win. The only playoff game I can remember him winning on the road was 2006 against the Chargers. The Chiefs. The the Chiefs in 2018. I was going to save that for last. That's one of my most memorable games. And then one of the pits, the 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 second – not the 01 one. I give that credit to Drew Bledsoe, the 2004 AFC Championship game in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, but anyway, guys, we're going to do a bit of a combo here as the two primetime games left on the window are presented by Bodog. Remember, guys, we'll match up to $400 on your first wager. And for this game, if I were to wager Sunday Night Football, I am wagering the Chargers. Why? Because they let the game get out of their hands, one. Two, I think Baltimore's due for a loss, even though they did lose to the Browns. Like, And three, actually, they lost to the Browns a, a couple weeks ago. And three... Just with all the talk of, is Brandon Staley going to make it through the year? Uh, all the memes with Quentin Johnson's mom and Indeed and stuff like that because he said he's going to ret- retire his mom and now he's people are making fun of him for being out of work. This screams kind of like in that same sense of why I think Tampa's going to win as well. That's why, and this is also too, this is a game the Chargers have to have. I, and I definitely I definitely love the Chargers on the spread at four or at three and a half, whichever you can get it. I think that, look, they're four and six. It's been a common theme on this show. Four and six versus four and seven. There is a difference. Yep. And they may not – it's very possible that kind of like when they were Sunday Night Football against the Chiefs last year, they, like, fought so hard. They knew that the, the division was on the line in that game. They fought so hard, and Patrick Mahomes broke their hearts at the very end, and the Chiefs won by three points. It wouldn't yep. surprise me if something like that, like something like that happening Like here. a 31-28 win. A loss. Yeah, we're, yeah, a lot where they're leading for a good portion of the fourth quarter, and then, like, the Ravens have that drive at the end that just breaks their backs – and then they ended up losing by three, but covering, which is the key thing. So mm. the result of the game, I can see going either way. But I, I see the Chargers putting up a fight here. And I remember when my Dolphins went to the Chargers on Sunday Night Football, the Dolphins were like three and a half point favorites. And I was a little arrogant. I was like, there's going to be more Dolphin fans than Chargers fans in that building. And then, so the Chargers are not going to give the inspired primetime effort that you oftentimes see in these situations. But they did. The crowd was more of a Chargers crowd than the Dolphins crowd. And the Chargers played like a team that was like rallying with the crowd, like fired up, like season, like really need this game to try to make the playoffs. I think they will come out strong. It may not be enough to win, but I think they will at least give the inspired effort. And look, all their, I think all but one of their losses, I think five of their losses are by four points or less. So again, they can lose, very well lose by three or four, like they always do. Uh, that still covers this number. I mean, <laughs> This is a tight spread, and I got to go with the Ravens to cover here. I mean, listen, the Ravens have been getting right defensively and offensively um, over the last month. And the Chargers, I mean, their only wins this year have been against bad teams. This team has routinely 
kind of, I mean, it's the Chargers, they've long had a reputation of shooting themselves in the foot. And I think that, you know, we've seen the, you know, Herbert has been pretty mistake prone this year. So I think that he's just going to have a horrible night against this Ravens secondary. I feel like Kyle Hamilton is totally going to pick him off here at least once. And I think that with this being a tight spread, I got to take the Ravens to cover here, even if the Chargers, um, you know, hold it to within seven, you know, that's still, that's still the Ravens, uh, you know, taking it. So I think that the Ravens are totally going to win this game. I mean, this just feels like two teams that are heading in the opposite direction. I don't care that the Chargers need this game. They've shown time and time again that they that they're just they're that team that they've got talent and they've got enough talent to give these good teams a good game. But in the end, they just they don't pull it together. They don't pull it out. So I think that's just gonna be the story of their season. It's just like, hey, well, maybe we maybe we could have been ten and seven, but instead we wound up six and eleven, and ah, that's how it happened. You know what? My my big thing is just I can see a world where this happens. Two things. One. The Chargers win this week, but the next week they somehow lose to the Patriots. Just it's just how things can go. It's like, you know, typical Char- Chargers will probably win this game. They'll be favored by like four or five, and then they'll they'll blow it. The other being for betting purposes, I would love to take the Chiefs at like minus four and a half and the Chargers at like plus five or plus five and a half and throw it into a teaser. You know? Lower the numbers, lower and raise the number, throw it into a teaser just for a little bit of fun. Um, But now, Monday Night Football. It's kind of funny. We started the week with the NFC North. We're ending the week with the NFC North. Bears, Vikings, does the pastor not get things right, or do we see a Bears upset brewing? I think think the Bears have a shot here, you know. Um, They they should have beat the Lions. They choked. Um, they, They do what they do. I understand. Fields was running the ball a lot in that Lions game. Earlier in the season when they were like really, really bad, like ghastly bad the first month of the season, Fields wasn't running the ball for whatever reason. Maybe they wanted to preserve his body. Maybe they wanted to see him develop more as a passer before making a decision on him as the face of the future. Whatever it may be, they were not running him earlier in the season. He ran for over 100 yards against Detroit. If that part of his game is back, that's a big deal. Now, the concern is Brian Flores – I feel like Brian Flores is really, really good at beating up on below average quarterbacks. And Fields, you know, he has talent. A lot of a lot of people like him. At this Just point, below middle. Career, yeah, he's below middle. You know, despite the fact that he played well last week, he's still currently below middle until we have more data. So I do wonder if Brian, Brian Flores will kind of mess him up a bit in this game. Uh, for that reason, I'm a little concerned. But I do think they're live, mainly because, like, like we said about Dobbs, it's an awesome story. I love it. It's a lot of fun. He is in a better situation in Minnesota than he was with Arizona. And I feel like Kevin O'Connell is doing a really good job coaching up this team with Dobbs and Brandon Powell and KJ Osborne as their main like passing game weapons for the last few weeks. And they went two and one and should have gone three and oh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, But I do wonder if, you know, as defense get more information on him in Minnesota system, does he start to play a little worse? Does he start to throw more interceptions? Like, I am kind of concerned about that a little bit, uh, especially since the Bears are playing better defensively, as you've mentioned, for the past couple of weeks now. So I think the Vikings probably win, but the Bears are live. And the Bears, we, we talk about, like, desperation spots. I mean, they're 3-8. and eight. It's now or never. Like, it, when it comes to, like, saving Fields' job, saving Matt Eberflus's job, like, this is it. Like, I, this I don't is all- think there's any say- – so two things I want to point out before we go to Jared. One, I don't think there's any saving Eberflus's job. I think that's just it. Two, um, I actually have three things I want to say. The second being, uh, Cole Komet has really proven his contract this year. He's having a really good year. Yep. The third, I think Jalen Johnson's in that top five, not top five, top ten corner conversation in the NFL. He's been looking really good. He is due for free agency this offseason. He is going to get paid a lot of money, and Chicago can give it to him. But give me this. Give me Minnesota to win, but by a field goal. So Chicago covers that three and a half. I'm this, actually, I think, is going to be a boring, like, 20-17 to 17 game. Yeah. I'm actually leaving Chicago here. Um, I, I feel like Minnesota is just a fraudulent playoff contender. Um, they won a game that they had no business winning um, against Atlanta. And then, you know, the fact that they, you know, I mean, the fact that they, they looked so just – they nearly blew it against New Orleans and James yeah, Winston. Remember. Yeah, near, nearly blew a huge lead against New Orleans. And that Denver game, you know, they just – 
that to me, it was like, okay, this is what we expected to see with a fill in quarterback, you know, coming in for a cousin's injury in the middle of the season. I, Dobbs has done all right. I, I do think it's a more advantageous situation for him than Arizona. Um, but I just think that this team is a lot more limited than people realize. And just because they, you know, they won those games against Atlanta, New Orleans. Um, to me, I think that Chicago with fields back, you know, you guys pointed out a uh, commit um, performing well in a contract year. DJ Moore. Come on, commit resigned this off season. He signed like a four year, $50 million deal. Oh, I'm sorry. Coming fresh off the new deal. Yeah. But he, he's looked great. You know, he, he's looked really good. You know, even with, um, even when they were starting out uh, the other dude, um, he was still producing um, yeah, Bajan, my fault. Um, but DJ Moore in every, so in every game, that Justin Fields has started that the Bears haven't gotten that other than the two games they got blown out, DJ Moore has gone completely off. And I don't think that there's anybody on the Vikings defense that can stop him. And then you add on to the fact that they got the running game going with Fields and they nearly beat the Lions, who at this point are a legitimate Super Bowl contender. I think that the Bears can do more damage offensively than the Vikings can, especially considering again that their defense has been playing better. It's easy to forget that they spent a lot of money in the offseason to upgrade the defense. So I like the bears to win here. It might be a boring 27 team, but I can actually see Chicago scoring a decent amount. Maybe, maybe they even win by double digits and really expose the Vikings, but I think they win either way. Oh, well, you know what? I'm going to bring back in our friend, big rat, but I I just think with Chicago, it's, you can't F up your own draft stock. You can do something like, I could. Th- I think there's a world where they trade a pick where there's another Carolina-like team who, because you know there are stupid teams out there that's going to overpay to get that number one overall pick because they have to have their QB of the future. Even though I'm on it and a lot of people are on it with with the Caleb Williams character concerns, so we'll wait and see what happens there. They, but oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to say very quickly, like for them to, I, I, I my Wi-Fi like cut out, but it sounds like you guys were saying about like whether or not they can get a haul for trading the pick for someone to get Caleb or Drake May. I think this is this is not going to be fair, but I think it's important. Like, it's not just that Fields has to play well; they have to win games. They are like six and twenty-two in Fields' of starts. It's like historically bad. And even if he plays well to close out the season, if that number goes to like six and twenty-nine or six and twenty-eight, and you then have to decide between continuing with that, making a decision on his fifth-year option, be prepared to extend him in a year. Or getting a quarterback who might be just as good won't won't be good his rookie won't be as good his rookie year in comparison for sure, but long term ceiling wise might be as good. And you reset the salary clock on him and start paying him a rookie quarterback salary for another four years. I think it's really hard to turn that down. Like the Jets were in this spot with Sam Darnold and Zach Wilson, and Mike Tannenbaum may or may not be obviously bad NFL general manager. So we can take his words with a grain of salt, but he was like pretty adamant earlier in the off season before it was a given what the jets were going to do. We didn't quite know if they were going to take, cause they weren't, they, the beat writers said they were going to take Trevor, but when it was not Trevor Lawrence and it was Zach Wilson, it was a debate. Are you going to take Zach Wilson? Or are you going to stick with Sam Darnold? And Mike Tannenbaum was like adamant. Like this is not a decision. This is the easiest decision in the world. They're both high upside prospects, and you reset the salary clock on the quarterback. It buys the head coach more time because everyone has lower expectations for a rookie quarterback. Not He's like, he, he, he was like, this is the easiest decision in the world. You swap out quarterbacks. So with Fields, Fields is in a really shitty situation where his play can't take the decision out of their hands. Like Kyler Murray can prevent the Cardinals from having to make a decision if he plays so great and they win so many games, he pulls them out of the top pick. That's out of Fields' control because they have that Panthers pick. So Fields can play awesome. They can win nine games, and they'll still have the first overall pick or second overall pick or whatever to make a decision. So it's not enough for him to play well. It's so it's going to be so hard for any general manager in Chicago to say, we're going to stick with the quarterback who is 6-28 in three years over Caleb Williams or Drake May. I just think it's impossible for anyone to side with Fields in that situation. They need to win. He needs to play well, and they need to win. So with Chicago, they have coming up, they have obviously they're in Minnesota Monday night, but then they have their bye week. But then coming out of their bye week, they have the Lions, the Browns, uh, week 16 Christmas Eve against the Cardinals. That's going to be a very, very, that's a tankathon right there, folks. And then the Falcons week 17, and then they wrap up at Lambeau. I feel like that game at Lambeau. All those games are winnable. All those games are winnable. I said all those games are winnable. 
Um, I, I would say all, but yeah, I would, I'd even include Detroit in that winnable one. I, I throw money on a David Montgomery revenge touchdown, but they're winnable games. I, I think with Chicago though, it's just, you could try to trade your pick back to have someone else who wants to move up and overdraft a quarterback. But I think regardless, like you said, there's a world where I think you keep him, but at the same time too, I don't think that world exists. I think you have to go with what's logical and what makes the most sense for your football team. And that is get the new quarterback. It's like the Patriots with Mac. Yeah. I said after two weeks, I'm like, he's earned his fifth year option, but he's just kept making mistake after mistake and costing the Patriots games to where, and yes, it's always about the Patriots folks. Um, but it's just where I'm just like, you know what, you're over it and you got to restart because I'd rather pay a rookie on the rookie scale for four or five years than having to worry about picking up a fifth year option on someone who has mental mistake after mental mistake. So that's what I have to say on my little soliloquy. Fair enough. Jared, anything else to add? Uh, not to, uh, nothing else on my end. Gentlemen, thank you very much for doing this guys. If you're working on Black Friday or if you're working on Thanksgiving, you can always give us a listen. Remember, yeah. guys, I got to throw this in quickly. You know what? Bodog, one of the sponsors of the show. We love to have him here. Have a happy Thanksgiving to the two of you guys. For me, personally, I have to work on on Thursday, but it is what it is. I'll definitely be able to catch out the second half of the Dallas game and the night game. But you know what, guys? Enjoy your Thanksgivings down south and enjoy a whole weekend of football where – I'm going to say this right now. I want to see Ohio State win on Saturday. Have a good one, everybody.